All right, and we're in. This is the Dialogue Box with Gwen Frey, and today we are joined with Jason Mojica. Hello, everybody. Hello. Chris Light cannot be joining us, I'm afraid. He's actually had some bad news. Um, he was recently laid off from Yaw Wolf. They had a massive layoff, and he's oh, no. transitioning back to the UK. Oh, what? I know. Oh, God. Oh, and I, I don't want to start on a downer. Everything's downers these days, though. Well, that sucks. When did that happen? Was it during the week? Uh, I think it was just a couple days ago, yeah. What? Yeah. He's got, like... <laughs> The other thing is because he moved here from the UK and he doesn't have any stuff. I don't know how this works, but like he basically they're like, okay, now you have, you don't have a job. And he's like, okay, um, I have to leave the country. Are you going to fly me home? And they're like, mm. do we legally have to? And he's like, I don't know. I was kind of hoping you <clears throat> would know being as you're the one that laid me off and stuff. And then they had to like scramble. And then I guess they've uh, they've agreed to fly him home. Uh, so that he is not, I guess, deported by... Oh, well. Because it's actually very expensive to get flights from Santa Fe to the UK. And, you know, it's just a whole thing. <sighs> I, I remember um, one of our co-workers, when they left Irrational, uh, there was some interesting legal stuff that happened because they had bought their visa or something. And they tried to get them to pay, like... Ten thousand dollars to leave or something like Ooh. that. Yeah. Well, a lot of those. So what usually happens is you'll get if you're being moved to America. For one thing, they'll they'll pay for your relocation. Yeah. So they'll give you like ten thousand dollars to physically move your stuff, <laughs> and to move yourself. Um, but if you leave within a year, they make you pay that back, and that's why their way of saying like, look, we're paying a lot of money to bring you here. You better stick around. Don't just take this and then leave within a month. But generally, yeah. when you get laid off, I. Uh, that you don't have to pay that back usually. I don't think he. I don't think he was laid off. I think they left. He, she, whoever it may be, <laughs> was uh, left. And then, but the thing is, is like we went through like some crazy hardcore crunch just before that. So it was like they put in their time. You know, everybody kind of put in their time. Uh, so I feel like yeah. there's a. I know who you're a, talking about. Yeah. <clears throat> That happened to a few people, actually. You uh, do. But one of them got a lawyer, and then they left him alone. <laughs> oh, that's the one I was thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's kind of like, it does become a thing where it's like, what if the, what if you bring somebody over, and you pay for their visa, and you pay to move them, and then you make them immediately crunch really hard so that they burn out, and they leave within a year, but they feel trapped. They can't leave within a year because you've got these golden handcuffs, which is if you try it's, to leave, you have to pay back your relocation, your visa and shit. It's so, pretty messed up. So it's like, if you try to quit, you owe $15,000. That's a really fucked up situation to be in. It really is. Because not only would you be like, 15 k <laughs> is a lot of money to go, like, you essentially would have made nothing while being there. And you would have worked really hard while you were there. Yeah. And that to me is... But I mean, I see. It's like one of those weird injustices, and I, I see I the had other never side of it too. Because like getting a visa for somebody is extremely difficult, it's extremely time-consuming, and it costs a lot more than they're actually asking to pay back. And if you pay right. for that visa and you pay to move somebody, and then they quit within a month, and they just used your company to move here, that sucks too. Yeah, so I'm I, sure. It's there's not like... like there's no reason for this, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean that's sort of there to protect the company as well. But I felt like in our situation where, like, the crunch and everything like that, they probably should have handled that a little bit differently. Yeah. I mean, you get – Riot has a system where if you want to leave within the first – I think it's, like, a couple months or something. Basically, they have a completely different system from what I understand. Well, they'll pay you. They'll pay you to quit. <laughs> they, they, they give you – like, if I recall, if you quit, if you want to leave, if you want to quit – uh, pretty early on they will not only not require you to pay anything back they will pay you to leave because some people just aren't a culture fit which you That's can go back and forth like i liked that a lot more before the stories came out about riot <laughs> before mm. the stories came out i was like damn that's interesting <laughs> then the stories came out and i'm like damn they might have a real fucked up culture like it's hard to say which <laughs> side of that like it's really hard to know from the outside yeah i feel like because now it's suspicious I, yeah I feel like if you've been in the industry, the AAA industry for long enough, 
like most of this material could be put into a comedy special <laughs> where it's like taken at face value as a joke because <laughs> like some of it's yeah. just so ridiculous well at the other side of that i mean it becomes the thing where or do you remember early on when they were like oh we're gonna give you free you know snacks and free food and you have cots <laughs> so you can sleep in the o- you can take a nap in the office and you first hear about that and you're like this is cool this is basically like home away from home and then you're like oh because college they never want you to leave yeah that's the other side of it and they're like check out these cool metal bracelets we got <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they attach you to your desk so when you're close by your computer turns on automatically yeah oh god or like what was the um you know you think about this when you start a company because like, we were thinking about so I remember early on when we were founding the molasses flood, we were talking about what do we do once we actually have employees because we were about to start staffing up right when I was leaving. And mm-hmm. we had a lot of conversations about how much PTO do we give? Because up until then, we had the idea of like, if you want to take time off, just take time off. But yeah. the thing is that cuts both ways. Like sometimes that's a sign of a company that's really open minded, you know, a, a company that totally trusts you. But on the other hand, there's a lot of companies where you feel pressured to never take that time off and yep. you can be on a role where it's like you're always kind of required and it never feels like it's the right time to take it off. And even if you don't intend to as somebody who owns a company, even as somebody who owns a company, you can be like, we have this really open policy because we want to be as understanding as possible. But people can take that the wrong way. They can take that to people can <clears throat> can feel put the pressure on themselves, but feel like it's coming from you or whatever, you know? Yeah, like I mean, I I had a very similar situation when I was working at Starbreeze as the lead. And like some of the employees were kind of like pretty lax. Some of them were on time. Uh, some of them were early. And then some of them would just come in like 30 minutes late. You know, it's like kind of like whatever. It was super chill. Wait, for the you most had a, part. the concept of late? <clears throat> what was that? You had like a dedicated start time at Starbreeze? No, that's the thing. But they so, like, sort of were like, hey, you late? should come in around you should come in before 10 because all like all morning mm. meetings started at like 10. Okay. Core um, hours. So if you, yeah, core hours, it's like, you know, it's the core hours thing. Yeah. Um, but some people, <clears throat> you know, would just kind of chill and come in a little later than that. And, you know, to me it was like, you know, they these were high functioning individuals. They could get their work done. So it wasn't a big deal. Um, at least for me. And especially because when, when, when I was working in the AAA industry in the States, if you were like 10 minutes late, you got talked to it was like you and it was stressful it was very what? stressful no because yeah. i've rolled in it new in every job <clears throat> maybe I've it's ever. different maybe it's different per discipline or something like that but i remember at design? At even at raven at irrational uh i did yeah i think uh, i think maybe like a few times but the thing mm-hmm. the other thing too was uh even at raven and this just goes beyond irrational it was like like even at raven i, I showed up like i don't know 15 minutes late one day and I was going in the side entrance just because that's where I parked. And one of the leads from like the other side of the building just happened to be walking by at a brisk, brisk pace to be like, hey, you're late and you should never show up on like late like this. And I was just thinking, like, what do you do here? You know, I just got so angry. I was like, I was like, do you know you don't even do anything here? Like, you're just grandfathered into this situation. Like, why are you telling? And then same guy gave me a review that was like the wrong review for somebody else at the studio. I was like, dude, I know there's a lot of Jasons here, but you can't fucking mo- can't be mo- doing that. Problems, man. <laughs> but yeah, Cause going to Sweden, trouble. it was like going to Sweden was super chill. It that's, was that's it not was Sweden. more relaxed. You just had some shit bosses. Like I don't know, yeah. especially at tech. Like you, nobody cares. I've never had anybody care when I roll in, so long as the work gets done. That's the that's most because they thing. know you're the one that's running the boat. <laughs> you, you're the tech people don't, don't get don't get told no as much. Like it's always it, that's. I've I would never, say that's most. I'm never the technically case. tech. I just work with it. Like my, most of the time, I'm working with programmers. Most of the time, they're not going to be in before noon anyway. Like if I get in at ten oh. or um the first one in the office no matter what so if i get in at noon i'm probably the first one in the office so it doesn't really matter like when your boss rolls in like el not elmar actually was always an early bird you know who else was a super early bird steven alexander would be there at 4 a.m and i was like we were we stayed late one night working on something me and like i think two other people and uh at like four in the morning uh it wasn't a security guard that walked by us it was steven he was like hey guys and i was like (laughs) 
he sounds like really bright and chipper and i was like i was like steven what are you doing here it's four in the morning he's like yeah i like to come in early and like get a lot of work done oh i totally understand that too for him because he is in a situation where he was like he's the primary effects person but he was also the person who knew the most of the scripting he was just very important so the second other people are in the office he gets randomized by other people just all damn day so he just and it reaches a point where (laughs) I've done what he does, so I know it. Like, mm-hmm. when the people you work with a lot tend to stay later and later, it eats into your time. So you start, maybe it's accidental at first, and you realize it's a really good idea, just coming in earlier and earlier, because that that's how you s- steal your hours. So like, if all the programmers are going to come in at, like, noon and stay until 2 a.m., yeah. and you want to be the one that comes in at 6 a.m. so that you can get your shit done without being randomized yeah. by the programmers. Yeah, no, that makes true. sense. I mean, literally, from... From the point that people showed up to the point that like he left he was helping other people do stuff yeah. and i do, i remember feeling that too when i was when i was lead at, at starbreeze i was constantly chasing things down for everybody and then it'd be like everybody would leave and then it'd be like <sighs> yeah i guess i'll start getting my work done <laughs> so you do it on one side or the other and generally you try to uh <clears throat> Depending on who you are, you basically do the opposite. Like, you reverse crunch pro- it. You come in earlier. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if that's why Elmore gets in so early. That makes sense. I right? probably should have, you know, just thinking about that, I probably should have done that too because when it gets too late in Stockholm, the the, the subway stops. So I'd always end up getting um, taxis home because mm-hmm. it was just quicker. It would take like 10, 15 minutes for taxi, but like 40 by train. And, uh, and I remember like... During one summer, I racked up like, I think I racked up like five thousand dollars in like taxi bills or something like that. Did you get the company to reimburse you for that? I did, and I felt bad every time. <laughs> I felt really bad. Uh, if and I remember you they, crunch, I remember they got a Bo's pay. mom would look at me and be like, "You should stop staying late." <laughs> Bo's mom. Yeah, she was the HR lady. The uh, CEO of the company's mom was the sort of like HR lady. She was working. She was like, I don't even know how old she is. She must have been like huh. 70 or 80. That is she... the weirdest version of a family business I've ever known. Usually it's the kids working for the all. Yeah, weird. No, yeah. I think she just likes to stay busy. And I think that's really cool. Um, yeah. She was really nice. Super nice. That's awesome, um, actually. Yeah. Well, but we were we were talking about. Uh, I didn't know what we were talking <laughs> but uh well i yeah. don't think we had started talking yet actually i think we just kind of went on this we were gonna yeah, we i was gonna complain about, about my week but you know <laughs> oh we were talking about uh chris and then like the uh, compensation yeah. packages <clears throat> and like all kinds of like <laughs> things with like paying your visa and yeah oh yeah gosh. all yeah, right I well did. I had to leave the country. I don't know. Like a, a lot of this stuff, when you're starting a business, you want to do the thing that's right for all the people. But it's just, and this is, I've talked about this. Uh, we we completely agree, and I've talked about this a million times. Like the ideal solution in my mind is to keep your company as small as possible. Only have like one to three. <laughs> the scope I'm working at, one to three people in the company. Use a lot of contracting, specifically contract houses, not individual contractors. So you don't contribute to the gig, gig economy. You know, and you can try to do everything right and you can still mess it up. Like, because some amount, like. I mean, I, I share that sentiment as well, because I early on, I mean, I wanted to I wanted to bring on a bunch of people and just realize that logistically we wouldn't be able to do it. Like, we don't have the money to bring on a bunch of people full time. Mm-hmm. Um, just because, like, if you do that and you and you screw up once, your your company can fold. Yeah. Like even with like one person. Um, and it, it's well, yeah, paying people is going to be the most expensive thing. But and then there's the other side of it. You don't want to hire people contract because that contributes to the gig economy, and that's part of what's why there's so much anxiety in the world today. I think and. And you don't want to make people work for free, and uh, like, there's no perfect solution, and there's so much risk in tech, right? Like, yeah. everything could get canceled. So, I don't. I honestly believe the vast majority of people, like, anytime a story breaks, uh, where like a lot of people are upset about the way something went down, I always try to think about the best case scenario where the business owner was doing what they thought was right and good mm-hmm. in the moment to try to. It's all. Because most of the time that is true. There's just unintended consequences for things. 
Yeah. yeah. It's shitty. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, yeah. No, yeah. it's it's interesting. I mean, I'd love to I'd love to ask more indies like about that that moment in time where they were like we're going to we're going to grow, you know, and you can kind of look at a whole handful of indies within the last like 5 or 6 years that were like, okay, we're, we're going to grow, but I'd love to see the ones like just hear from the ones that did and then also from the ones that decided not to and just get like a good sample size of the ones that are still around and the ones that have like kind of like perished i guess would yeah be like. i mean we could talk about uh, i mean i have these conversations a lot um a really good friend of mine somebody i showcased a game next to Gion owned a made a game called contrast you might know his studio got purchased by microsoft pretty recently um, I think so. He also made a game. Shit, <laughs> I'm spacing on the name of it right now. But uh, he he basically every time you you move up, every time you scale up, the culture of your studio changes, and there's way sure. more stress and way more pressure because you have to keep everybody employed. Um, it make it impacts the kinds of decisions you can make. It impacts how risky you can be. I think, yeah. like it, it just changes just changes your perspective <clears throat> it's one of the i mean there's there's two sides of it too in a way it could make you safer like the only reason you can't sell a company to microsoft if your company is one person that's not even really selling a company that's just sort of an aqua hire right <laughs> like they're just hiring you at that point right yeah um so unless you have a killer ip like uh, i was gonna say like you have to have a unless you have if your name and your and your your, if your ips have weight behind them yeah okay there's a difference there that's true um but i mean hiring a person uh versus just buying the studio with one person kind of is the same would cost about the same it's the ip that in the tech possibly that distinguishes it mm -hmm. i go into that too i think the value of tech goes down uh you know what you want to talk about double fine yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. It made a lot of sense for Tim Schafer to sell Double Fine to Microsoft. I don't think it made a lot of sense for Microsoft to buy Double Fine. Hmm. And I'll go into why. Here's my theory. Because I've, uh, okay. I've thought this through. Put me on that roller coaster. I'm okay. strapping it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I like it. Double Fine has been, I, I totally empathize with Tim Schafer's position. Like it is very difficult to constantly be pitching games to the public to publishers like yep. it wears you down constantly trying to get your work funded and they never had enough money that they could just make their own games they had to constantly go back on this roller coaster or this this treadmill where they're constantly trying to get games funded and that's, that'll wear you down and it's really really pleasant to just be owned by a company that has unlimited money um and just only have to pitch to your superiors like that's cool so i get why he did it on the other hand I feel like a lot of what Double Fine is, is their reputation, is their ability to... Their, their games don't make a large return relative to how much they cost to make. Um, their studio's in a very expensive place. It's in San Francisco. It takes a lot of money for it's them like to make... It's like right down from the Nascone Center, isn't it? Yeah. Their ROI is not great, right, for a lot of their games. They're not making a, a massive amount of returns. So but what they had before was that they could throw a Kickstarter and get a bunch of money. They had goodwill. They had the will of the people. They had... They were um, really good at promoting themselves and being popular on YouTube and on things like this. They had a, they did game development as a performance in a way, right? Like they didn't yeah. just make games. Also a huge part of, um, a huge part of what people got out of Double Fine wasn't just the end product. It was watching the product get developed um, and, and being part of that process and feeling part of that process. As soon as they got bought by Microsoft, they lost that. Maybe Microsoft will let them keep, you know, doing their, their stuff, doing their um, documentaries their and, and their podcasts. Yeah. Even if they do, they don't have the ability to say, hey, guys, they don't have the ability to reach out to their fans and monetize that. They can't go out to their fans and be like, hey, uh, we've been we're working really hard on this bold new game. Will you kickstart it? They'll be like, no, you're owned by Microsoft. Get them to do it. So all that stuff that they did as performance before that they could get they could monetize that in different ways they can't really monetize that as much anymore in my opinion. Yeah, but at the same time they don't really need to anymore. They um, don't need to, but I didn't say it was a bad idea for them. I said it was a bad sure. idea for Microsoft. I think Microsoft underestimates how much their revenue stream comes from these alternative solutions. The the perf 
performance the involving the community in their games and that sort of thing and the ways that yeah, double fine has been I'm not sure if that. that's where they were think if that's I don't know if they were even really thinking about that though when they purchased them because double fine is a really well known brand now and they've been I mean they've been climbing up in the you know getting a lot of other people to know about them I mean they've got a, another big game coming out um the next Psychonox game is going to put them on the map again, like in a different way than a lot of their smaller indie projects generally did. So I do think that now is the time to pick them up. You think um, they're about to, you think Psychonauts 2 is going to take off and they actually got the, they made a bet that Psychonauts 2 is a really, really good game that's going to help them grow a lot? I don't know about that. I mean, there's probably a little bit of that for sure. I think you can't ignore that if you're thinking about purchasing double fine i don't think you can really ignore that i mean and then they have all these other smaller games and their amnesia stuff going on and if i was microsoft i wouldn't i wouldn't change a thing i'd let them continue to be them oh, i would definitely agree with be that mostly because it would be terrible it would be if, bad pr tim, as yeah. well <laughs> if tim schaefer like, wants to tweet out like microsoft were jerks to us that's uh, gonna be bad for microsoft <laughs> I don't know. Like, I do find it really funny when John Oliver like constantly shits on AT and T because they they're the ones that pay the bills. <laughs> he's always like, "Hey, business he's daddy." Like, yeah, yeah. He's like, "I got you, business daddy. I got you." <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I don't know, man. I think I think yeah. If they were don't smart, talk about politics just... in a games cod podcast, Mojica. <laughs> We have no, rules. <laughs> <laughs> but the yeah, no, I think it's fine. I I honestly I think. I think Microsoft is, they're sort of taking a little bit of a gamble. You know what's interesting? Somebody mentioned this the other day. I was reading some topics on this. I don't remember where I read it, but how, you know, Discord tried to start a store. Like yeah, they own. just canceled that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And what's scary and weird about that, and it makes sense because we always talk about EGS and or the Epic Game Store, mm -hmm. is that, you know, Epic's taking a different approach to it that I think is actually working for them versus Discord. I don't think they really had a plan going in. They were just, we're going to put a bunch of games on the store and then people are going to start using it. And they had like such a huge base. You know, they have mm -hmm. a huge base of people on here. It's like 50 million or something crazy. I mean, technically they had the same plan. Epic, they said, we'll take a smaller cut and we have... I, I mean, at the time, what everybody was looking at was... There's incredible growing unrest among developers towards Steam because there's no discoverability on Steam. And there's even among consumers at the time, um, obviously Steam's been making changes. But at the time, have you ever been stuck in that loop where you're just like looking through endless numbers of games? And you just feel like everything recommended is crap or just not. There's probably something better if you just keep hitting the spinner and you spend like an hour or two looking for the next game you want to play yeah that's not a fun experience and i think every consumer for the most part felt that experience at least a couple times if you've been using steam for a while and i think yeah. there was a lot of people saw that and a lot of people saw an opportunity to try to take to try to take a bite out of steam to make the right, highly, curated set the curated storefront it's not like this is new i mean gog has been around gog's big shtick is we won't do any drm um and I, I do think around. that um i do think that like the way that Epic differs in this scenario is that they aggressively went after indies and games that people really wanted or proved that people really wanted either through a Kickstarter or, you know, high profile indies that haven't come out yet that are going to come out soon. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Discord was, ne they might have been doing that a little, but they didn't toss around. I don't know if they had the money that Epic had. They have the people, but I don't think they have the money in terms of what Epic was willing yeah. to throw around. Their exclusives um, were much smaller. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it is it does prove, like, if you try to... Because everybody... One of the biggest things people are saying about the Epic Game Store is why don't... Why doesn't Epic fund games that haven't... Um, that nobody's heard of? Why doesn't Epic go from the beginning and fund games? Why are they taking these games that people know? But the thing is, Discord tried that, right? Like yeah. b with Bad North and with a bunch of other titles, and um, it's y y it's just because like how do you find uh, it, it's just hard like finding figuring out which games to fund is hard, and usually you need 
How else do I put it? So the other thing you have to keep in mind is most of the time when you hear about a game, uh, most of the time when a consumer hears about a game, that game isn't completely funded yet. Because yep. the only way you can get a publisher or anybody to fund you is to prove that there's an audience. And mm -hmm. as a consumer, you are that audience. And the way that you convince publishers to give you money is that you put up a store page on Steam and you promote the hell out of the game and then you show the publisher your wish list number. And you're like, look, this many people want this game. And then mm -hmm. you get funding. The problem is as soon as <laughs> there was a competitor, like as soon as people started doing that with Epic, then now there's a huge problem, right? Because all your wish lists are on Steam and you're not just you're not just pitching your game to publishers anymore. You're pitching your game to Epic now too, uh, where they will obviously want you to not have your game on Steam. So I don't think Epic is doing anything different than every other publisher. I don't think game developers are doing anything different than they've always done. It's just now we have to find a way to prove to publishers that the game is something consumers want without the the hard number, which is Steam wish lists, um, which is difficult. Because that was really that was a really easy thing to do. Just, how interested are people? This many people have wishlisted the game. Like that was a really nice right. hard number you can give to somebody. Hmm. That's interesting. Did you use that? To, I mean, just because I've never, I haven't tried that before. Um, is that something that you used to use as a as a tactic to help get uh, at the people interested at the molasses flood? Yeah. Um, no, 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 not at the molasses flood. Actually, uh, oh, okay. for various reasons. Like we definitely, we used our sales numbers, but I mean, that's pretty standard. But like this many people bought the flame in the flood. We have an audience about this big. Oh, we expect right. at least that many people will buy our next game. And I suppose before but that, we, it was we like Kickstarter plus, uh, mm -hmm. like I, you were like, yeah, our Kickstarter was successful and yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Obviously a successful Kickstarter helped. But I mean, another thing is a lot of people won't like you have a kickstarter as a way to per, to raise awareness but a lot of people won't fund your kickstarter because they don't want to give money to you if your game doesn't come out but they will wish list your game immediately on steam while your kickstarter is going yeah so kickstarter gives you a massive spike to your your wish list numbers but we just need something that's not wish lists now is basically what it comes down to because it is yeah because if you want to take advantage of the epic game store <laughs> I, I mean is you understand Do they have a pre-order button or here? anything like that on EGS? You, yeah, yeah, like kind of up for pre-order, but they don't but have because you're coming they out don't have soon. Wish lists, all right? Like you can't be like, I care about this game. That's not a thing you can do right now. But, uh, but as soon as you have an EGS store, <clears throat> can people pre-order it? You can put or... up a coming soon page, or you can put up a pre-order page. I mean, okay. the other thing is, I don't want to say too much, not because I don't know, but because it changes so fast. Like sure. they're building this store. They just put out Epic put out a uh, what do you call it? A dev portal last week. Up until now, it's been like in the beginning. <laughs> like when right. the stone tablets <coughs> were formed. No, well, I mean, in in the beginning, in January, uh, the only way to get in the storefront was like you emailed Joe. <laughs> and you had right. to you had to know Joe, and if you didn't know Joe, you were fucked. Uh, or somebody gave you Joe's email and told you <laughs> this is the email, and then you emailed Joe, and then I. Uh, and then that Joe hired some people, but that takes time to hire the right people and make sure they're not assholes and that this can pan out. So yeah. now there's like Joe and Hector and Coop and like, I think I'm going to guess six to eight people. There's a bunch of people I don't know anymore that oh, are vetting yeah. the games. In the beginning, the way you got something done on the storefront was uh, you emailed uh, Amanda or <laughs> like there was two to three people and you emailed them art assets. And they mm -hmm. would show you an image of what the storefront... Keep in mind, when you're setting up a storefront, there's the way your store looks at different resolutions. There's the way your store looks on the phone. There's the way your store looks on right. different phones. You know, like, there's yeah, all these yeah, different yeah, ways yeah. your store could look. And so they would send you, like, I don't know, here's four ways the store could look based on what you've given us. And it's like, well, fuck. And so you would just email back and forth and guess and check because they didn't have the ability to show you what the store would look like in any way you could see until they published gotcha. it live. Like, that's funny so and in the beginning like there was things like um anytime i requested a change like i'd give them a new screenshot for some reason we would lose all the localization like kind is being localized into nine languages and for some reason like this 
things were stomping on each other. Like this was really rough when it started. And it, over the mm. months, like it gets better and better. They um, they're really cool because like they um, I'm in a Slack channel with them now. Mm-hmm. Like so, rather than email, we've Slack. We moved up in the world here. Nice. But it's st- <laughs> and it, now they have a portal. Like there's an actual back end that you can look at. I can look at my sales for my That's pre-order good. numbers. Yeah. I don't, I don't even know they're if Geo like. We had a we had a very similar experience with GOG, where they were just like they actually I think for the most part, they just kind of grabbed our screenshots that we uploaded to Steam or something like that, and mm-hmm. just put a put like one of our trailers that we wanted up on the front, and yeah, we were. I worked with GOG. That was interesting because they just did your storefront for you. Yeah, um, and I totally get that. I mean, I mean, there's this pretty simplified. It, it there's there's not there's not a whole lot of like super custom stuff in there mm-hmm. and i suppose steams is pretty is pretty chill as well but it, it does require a lot like i don't know i i spent a good like week and a half maybe two weeks just like muddling through like literally just trying to find the publish to workshop or like upload type thing steam is and, like, so easy compared to everything else I mean, it was super convoluted. It was like there was a oh, million different menus. I, you had to I, go here, then you had I've to go lost, over here, and then you had to like. <laughs> I have lost all respect for anybody that has trouble with Steam now, like because they are by far the easiest, and they require so little. Like there was some dust up because Steam requires two header images now, and people are like, "You need two oh, you images." Need to update that. I'm like, bitch! I've had to for some of these stuff. <laughs> Do you understand Stadia is on the phone and on like the inner in a browser? Stadia is a, a, a yeah, it, it's not trivial. They're doing yeah, a you've cool got thing, like, but yeah, I mean, honestly, if you're gonna do a store now at this point in time, you need to front load a lot of that stuff for the developer so that they don't have to worry about it because you're um, just gonna end <clears> up with like a huge quality gap in a lot of things well you gotta you want your storefront to look consistent you want all the store pages to have some kind of consistent look which is why GOG's yeah. solution is they gate how many games can come through and they they handcraft each page and you have to sign off but they handcraft each page whereas like epic is moving at a, a rate where they can't necessarily do that and they want their storefront to look unified and they're building it as they go so and they've yeah. they do things I think are pretty smart. Like the you have to have a logo that's in Flash basically, and then that's on top of an image. And the image can be I'm still kind of unclear in the different ways the images can be cropped. Google's doing some cool shit I can't talk about, but okay. I'm really into some of the stuff they're doing. But it is still a lot of work to get all the images together and stuff. Yeah, I've um, got like several folders for like this website, this website, this website. You know, it just it just keeps going on and on. Uh, mm. It's a lot of work. And it, like with the size, you can't change the size of your logo. Uh, on the Epic Games Store, something that frustrates me right now is like, if you go there, you'll see like there's an image and then there's a logo. It's always going to be in the exact middle and you can't set what that size is. <laughs> but so like every time somebody does, you take your key art from other storefronts where you probably have your logo embedded in the image. You take it out and you try to put it up yeah. there. But like you may not have the logo directly in the middle at the exact size that they do in the Epic Game Store. Maybe you have right. your logo low. Maybe you have it high. So now your logo is just like on somebody's face. <laughs> right. And so I now think you gotta, that's like... for GOG. I think um, <clears throat> if I if I just glance over, I'm pretty sure the one for Proteus uh, is actually because they had like the title. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. If, if you look at the one for Proteus, uh, generally speaking, our logo is in the middle like you can see my logo right here yeah right? i see it's it behind the, you yeah yeah the word proteus is supposed to be like in the center of the the mouth or whatever but for them it was like and now it's like off to the side so now it's just like a, a void mouth thing that's just open i guess the play button is there it's, and i was like well if you're gonna if you're not like, gonna have the title there we should just undarken the mouth so it's not just like uh look yeah yeah i know and you feel like like, look, I know I sound like a princess, but I've spent way too much time getting this this image to look just right. You just fucked yeah. it up with your shit. <laughs> Could you please? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, well, it's hey. frustrating. It's cool being on... Like, it is cool watching these storefronts grow, though. It is really cool watching Epic grow. Like, I yeah. actually really enjoy that. And I same think it's going to be fun. Same thing with Stadia. It's going to be fun, for sure. It's fun. I'm, I'm very interested to see how Stadia turns out. I'm still pretty... Like, uh, you know, I'm just kind of sitting on the sidelines, just just yeah. seeing how things go, 
and you know i hope for the best you know but i mean for me i'm still skeptical of that whole streaming to your phone streaming to this and it all working like pretty well because like even on the switch i had i had some problems like with input lag from my controller to my tv and it was it was just enough that i immediately was just like i guess i'm just gonna play it in my hand from now on because like i'm just one of those players that needs to have instant input you know mm -hmm. um and that you just know, bothered me just enough see when i first pitched a stadia one of the pitches i did was that uh kind doesn't the kind is a puzzle game where there's absolutely nothing twitchy and so latency right. won't matter and at the time they were like super bullish they're like we don't actually care about that we like twitchy games are, I mean, I was like, are yeah, you I mean, that, they have you to, sure? They have, to, they have to double down on that. You know that, right? Like, well, they yeah. Have to double down on that. I mean, uh, yeah. And I mean, there is definitely what people say publicly and what they say behind the scenes. And I, but I think the interesting thing about, you know, a lot of people say this like it's a bad thing that Google spins up projects and pivots and and cancels some projects and stuff. But I think that's how you survive and succeed in technology, right? Is by being willing to change. And I'm curious to see how Stadia changes. Because I'm curious. They're they're definitely... Initially, they were really, really excited about their plans. They were going to launch like globally, worldwide. And they're like, you know what? Maybe we should gate this. Maybe we'll release in a couple of regions first. And mm -hmm. they, they announced what they did. Um, which I don't have memorized, so I'm going to shut the hell up. But uh, they announced the regions they're launching in. And that it requires a Stadia controller to start out with and so forth. Um, and they're they're starting this year as opposed to next year with a core group of like um, anybody who buys the Stadia controller like this year. And they're mm -hmm. going to kind of like see how it goes and stuff and, and pivot um, the platform based on that. Because yeah. I think when I go online, so there's, there's the things game developers complain about. Game developers complain about the input lag. Mm -hmm. People on the internet are complaining about like the press and shit. Uh, their biggest concern seems to be that they thought this would be Netflix. They thought it'd be more like Apple Arcade. Right. Their concerns are mostly the pricing model. And I'm curious to see it, which thing consumers actually care about. Because mm -hmm. there's what the press thinks, there's what game developers think, and then there's what consumers actually do. Yeah. Because um, I'm a developer, so obviously my biggest concern was the input lag. Uh, it, yeah. It's possible most consumers don't give a fuck, especially the kinds of consumers that don't have a c console yet. Uh, or like aren't... I mean... This is a well, I do think that like the important thing have a console. Like, what was that? Go ahead. Yeah. If you think about it, this is this is meant to be like you buy this and this is your last console. This is a platform you buy ideally instead of a PS5 or the next right. console generation. Because so they can just possible. keep upgrading things as they go. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that this appeals to a different consumer. It's possible that this, uh, like, it's hard to say exactly who this appeals to, and it's hard to say exactly how this hits around the world, right? Because right. you and I have a very american focused view of the internet whereas in africa they have they don't have landlines everything is 4g so when 5g rolls out what does that mean for stadia in africa what does this mean around the world in places where they're if once you like right now you need a controller and um you need to buy a game controller but soon you won't need to buy the stadia controller someday you'll be able to do this just with the mouse and keyboard and any screen or sure. any controller and any screen and when you hit that point and it's a global release, what markets does that open up that we don't think about right now? Because we are very focused on our what we think of as the internet. And I don't right. have, I don't have the answer to that. And it could be that this whole thing like is a giant disaster and it fails, but I think it's cool. I don't know. I mean, trying. when you put it in that perspective though, I think it's it's sort of like a I don't know, it's it's got this like this Cinderella feeling to it <laughs> or like all of a sudden the glass slipper fits and like everybody just and then things explode right i mean if if it ex okay so like best case scenario right they reach a portion of what steam reaches and like i think for them they know that in order to like really become a part of the current market you have to be you have to hit the hardcore gamers because if they adopt it then most likely the rest will adopt it that's their uh, that's their view that's a lot of people's view yeah, I mean, I, I I'm not just... sure how I feel about that. I'm not even sure. Like, I don't, I just, I think we have an assumption in our mind about how gamers behave based on what they're currently doing. And what they're currently doing is skewed based on our, here's the best example, because I'm going mm -hmm. off on a tangent now. Sure. My biggest gripe with Steam is not anything to do with anything anybody says that you hear about, like, the rev share and shit. 
my biggest gripe with Steam has always been that I feel that Steam unduly promotes games that have a long playtime. I think Steam has loops built into their interface that benefit people, that benefit games with a long playtime. And the way that they do this is when you see a friend playing a game, they have that little pop-up that's like, here's what your friend is playing. Yeah. Obviously, you're going to see that more if it's a game where your friend is playing for a longer amount of time. They also have, like, on their storefront, I can pull up Steam right now, but they've got the tabs, like, trending among, trending, um, trending among your friends. That's based on... Not on how much your friends like that game, but on how many hours your friends are putting into that game. And sure. that's a very important distinction because I think we, just because somebody plays a game for a lot of hours doesn't mean that game is necessarily their favorite game or a better game. Like my favorite games are ten, tend to be very short. Inside is one of my favorite games. Inside yeah. is a very short game. I love short narrative games or short puzzle games, yeah. you know, the single Same. player games. And these are these tend to be games that people don't play for very much. You might play a lot of them, um, and you might have a couple that are your favorites. They might be your favorite games, but there's you're not promoting those when you go on Steam. You're promoting the games that you put the most hours into, and I think this tends to skew things so that games that are have a lot of hours are more successful. And this is why you see roguelikes being so successful. This is why you see mm -hmm. the these games that we make as indies. We've decided the consumers want these games. We've decided that based on the fact that Steam promotes them accidentally through their algorithms and stuff. And when I see right. new storefronts, what excites me isn't that I think they're going to do what Steam does but better. It's that maybe they accidentally or intentionally do something different. Like, I would right. love to see the storefront that just has highly curated, that's curated, amazing, small gems. I'd love to see the storefront where rather than we promote the games that your friends are currently playing the most hours right now, I want to see the storefront where we promote what your friends rank is the best games for instance like why isn't right. that why isn't that tab the games that most of your friends like or the games that your friends rate the highest you know what i mean yeah i mean uh, there's there's an interesting <clears throat> thing going on right now where they're they're trying i think they know that they're in trouble um, steam in terms of yeah i, I do mm -hmm. i think i think a lot Ooh. of people sit around <laughs> and they try and fix that that problem yeah. um and I think one of the things that's come out recently is like, you know, Achiro did that. Uh, he's been working on like the six second trailer type thing where it like comes together. And like, uh, there's a lot of other things where like, they'll like, people are putting together massive trailers that like have like a bunch of games that you've maybe never heard of. Well, there's, um, that, there's another, you know, Ichiro did that thing with the micro trailers. And the very first thing, like most of my friend circle said was, we need to look into how to game that algorithm. So we have the perfect micro trailer. <laughs> Right. Like, it's how like, do we how do we fuss okay, well, with our trailer? First, is it the first second, the the fifteenth second, and then like you know, how do I how do I put that together? So, I know a lot of people were kind of like, oh, I want to upload my own micro trailer because yeah. then that would be that'd be good. So, um, so these storefronts, in a way, it, it just becomes like it becomes this cycle, right? Where everybody, yeah. I don't know, but I I will say I don't think I, I like that I like the amount of pressure that's on Steam right now because you're seeing that they're trying new things. Right? Yeah. Like, it's obvious. The micro trailers thing was cool. Didn't they do something this week? They changed they an did. algorithm. Yeah, so I think that's the thing that I was trying to allude to is that the there's people out there that are trying to do new things with, like, okay, so you have, like, a little bar, and it goes from, like, niche to, like, things that you would maybe like. And you can kind of just slide it and then hit the go button and it'll pop up some things that are like, okay, so like, for example, you've played some racing games. Okay. But maybe, maybe you've never heard of like a bunch of racing games that are on there that you might like that are just, that literally never hit their market. Right. Maybe they only sold like a thousand copies or something, but they had some positive reviews. The algorithm then grabs those titles from like the bottom of the bucket and then brings them up to the, the middle to surface up a little bit more. So then people are starting to see these games that they've never seen. Like I thought it was super interesting, like hella interesting. Cause uh, I, I tried it out and I was like, wow, look at all these cool games that I've never seen like ever. And they look pretty high quality. And it made me feel really bad as an indie. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I've never heard it. Like some of these games could be like my favorite games that I've never played. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's like an infinite number of them at this point. There is literally like a sea of games yeah. that no one's ever heard of that, you know, get introduced every single day. And like some of them are good. Some of them are bad, whatever. 
mm-hmm. but they're there and like i think that that they're trying to address the fact that like you know so many games get added per day they, and... yeah i mean i feel for everybody involved in this right like i feel for steam because they they're in a position where anytime they try to innovate or change something on their storefront they have just a wave of backlash first off you yep. have if the people who are trying to take anything they do and um monetize it in kind of like an evil way like what you saw with the steam trading cards you have the people yeah. who like you put out this thing with micro trailers some people have micro trailers look awful because they're it just doesn't work well for their trailer do you blame those people yep. for trying to like tweak the tweak their trailer a little bit tweak the cuts no, because like, no the micro trailer might be the only thing that gives them like of like a viral hit randomly yeah. and, and then like so some people do that and so then everybody feels the need to do it and so everybody's like why did steam go change this and then steam has to change it back because you know part of tech is trying things and failing um and so it becomes a nightmare to innovate at all like i get i just think it's good that there's more competition in the market right now in general Absolutely. i know I'm saying that as somebody who's like obviously i think that right like i took advantage <laughs> of that real hard but but I just, yeah. I, I would hope even if I didn't have these um, deals worked out, I would still be really excited about the competition in the marketplace. I think it's good. For sure. I mean, we, um, when we were at PAX, we got, we got approached by um, another marketplace that's really trying to jump up called Turbo or something like that. Mm. Um, they sent me like a PDF recently because they want, essentially their thing is that they have... <laughs> they have turbo bucks <laughs> but they also have uh they wanted to do like a 10 percent for them 90 percent for you as the developer uh but at the same time when people come to their platform their whole thing was like uh you know you you rack up bucks for playing games yeah it was, i think it's called uh turbo play yeah um so the more you, you play... rack up bucks for playing games that you can then spend on like other games. So if somebody buys a, your game with their turbo bucks, um, the developer still gets that money. Um, and it's like, it's just like a, an ecosystem for them to keep people coming back and playing more games mm-hmm. and things like that. But I don't know how successful something like that will be when like you've got Epic games and like, like free games coming out all the time that are, you know, like humble bundle does a really great job of like giving you, you know, great. I think like they're curated humble Humble bundles. Interesting. Six for a month is like really good. Yeah. Um, Humble bundles. Interesting. So humble, humble is sits on top of everything else and uses other storefronts, right? Like mm -hmm. you through humble, you get us, you don't get the executable for the game. You get a steam key. That confused me by the way. I was talking to John and Connor about that and I was like, so when do we have to do updates through you guys? And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, don't you have like a store where everything lives or something? You know, and I was, no. I was trying to like, I, I, I just totally forgot that they only deal in keys and it totally threw me off. I was like, wait a minute. Oh, yeah. It's like you guys don't actually have a store. No, they're interesting. They, they kind of sit on top of things. And how do I put it? I mean, in a way, it's a very symbiotic relationship um, because it Humble is more likely to pull new people into the ecosystem than Steam. Valve puts no little to no effort into pulling new people into their ecosystem. They rely on other people to do it. Sure. And that's why um, Steam will give you keys to give away or sell in a way. Like um, mm-hmm. you can sell Steam keys at... Uh, packs. I was selling Epic Game Store keys at Packs for the same reason. Like mm-hmm. the kind of consumer that's walking around Packs probably doesn't have a storefront installed, perhaps. Um, and this is how they get their new customers into their ecosystem. Right. Um, whereas Humble doesn't feel any particular need to lock people into an ecosystem they already have. Yeah, I don't know. Humble's always I mean, been really interesting. Yeah. I mean, I was on their page the other day and I was trying to look through it. And, you know, I heard that they. You know, there was a few months ago or maybe a year ago they sold like the original they like sold or like merged with somebody else and it was a pretty big deal and mm-hmm. then when i looked at their store like yesterday i was like okay well let me let me find the indies and it should be like first thing i see on the page but it wasn't it was all like triple a stuff and that really threw me that really threw me off for a bit i was kind of like i even told that to them when when we were at PAX, I was like, "Yeah, I went to you guys' website the other day, and I was like, well, where, where do you guys keep the indie stuff?'" I was like, "You know, I, I was like, all I saw was AAA stuff, like Call of Duty and and this and that, and 
and it kind of threw me off. I was like, well, if you're going to promote my game, like, wouldn't it, you know, why are you promoting AAA stuff? Like, they don't need to be promoted. <laughs> like, they don't, like, well, you and know, yeah, I think they're, was, they're trying to be a competitive storefront, too. I guess a storefront that doesn't have a storefront. I don't know. Well, that, I mean, that was what it was confusing to me. And, and they like, have the I ability. Was, what's interesting is what if Humble, what if you could sell Proteus, Steam keys on Proteus? So say you're already on Steam. You're already in Steam. And you already get a 70-30 split on Steam, right? Mm -hmm. But you can also sell your game through the Humble store. You do absolutely no effort. They're just selling Steam keys. But you get 80-20. No. That's not what happens, but wouldn't that be weird and interesting? <laughs> well, how would that even work? I mean, Steam would have to partner with them. To they do already that. are kind of partnered. But like, there's Humble, like some automatic. I mean, okay, sure. Like for. Well, I mean, now you're just using Steam as sure, a that could be That could be interesting. I'm, and but oh. they would be purposely scuttling their own. I don't know what. I, I mean, don't Steam already. That, but... Do you understand that Steam already does that though, right? Like. Steam key takes 0% of any Humble key. So every time you sell something through the Humble bundle, you cut a deal with Humble, you and Humble split the money, Epic, or sorry, uh, Valve gets nothing. Right. Okay, so you're talking about the keys, the, the generated keys, not necessarily the other stuff. Okay, yeah, okay. I, yeah, I get what you're saying. I mean, if, if that was the case, though, I mean, there'd be a really interesting... I think Valve would almost see an, an immediate shift to lots of requests for keys <laughs> because if you be like well i'm just gonna sell through humble at this point i mean they you know you it's only you a matter of time before somebody starts pushing on that and you're already seeing like it's not it's never been quite that blatant i mean i mean in all reality though well, like if that did happen what if it was, was just like, 25 like on if you sell a key through humble you get 25 percent. if you sell a key through steam you get sorry uh humble takes 25 percent. steam takes 30 percent. say that happened right I mean, mm -hmm. would how mad would Valve be? Like if Humble did that to Valve? Well, there was a website that did that, though. Um, uh, that was different. Those were stolen keys. Yeah. I, I don't think... You can't say that 90% of it was stolen. Maybe maybe 30 or 40. Probably. Mostly, yeah. I mean, well, the, the big thing there was people would buy like... um. You would get like a humble bundle. There'd be a couple games you didn't want. You'd sell them, resell your keys, which was harmless. But a lot of that stuff, the reason why people were so mad about that and that became such a big thing was because of um, cash. Uh, you'd buy keys with a credit card, wait a month, report that credit card stolen, get all the money back. And then mm -hmm. there was no easy way for the developer to cancel those keys. So the developer got no money. Um, mm. That was the reason why people were mad at those. Yeah, I'm mostly worried about... Like, as an indie dev, generating a bunch of free keys just isn't something that sounds appealing to me. Generating a bunch of free keys? What do you mean? Ge generating a bunch of keys to give to another store or... How do you think Humble works? I know that, but it's still... There's still, like, a reflex action where I'm just like... Like, for example... You know, when the game comes out, there's going to be a lot of people asking for codes, right? Oh, yeah. And I feel like, for me, it, it'll it be cheaper if we just don't give out any codes for the game afterwards. Like, we'll do it to our Kickstarter people because they yeah. deserve it. I mean, that's... But then, like, afterwards, I'm just like, the game's so cheap, anybody, anybody should be able to buy a review copy and play the game. I mean, you'll give away a couple review copies to, like... If Polygon wants a review key, you're probably going to give him a code, Mohika. Sure. Like, you'll There's... give away a couple. Like, yeah, we're probably... talking Polygon. We're talking, like, Kotaku. Yeah. Sure. Like, I there'll mean, be a couple of those, at least. But, why not? Uh, but, like, Super Joe's, like, MegaGaming.com. No, no. And anybody, anybody that's like, yo, give us keys so we can give away at our giveaway. But just be like, no. Like, unless it's a charity you care about, just be like, no. That's pretty standard. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about if you want to be in... If you decide to put Proteus in the Humble Bundle, you will go to Valve and you will say, I need a thousand keys. And then you will yeah. give that thousand keys to Humble. That's just what you're going to do. Possibly more or less than that. Depends. But like, yeah, yeah that's that's not weird. That's how Humble operates, right? Yeah, I guess I'm not... I'm not super... Okay, so I think Humble is the... 
example or like the outlier that I wouldn't be necessarily talking about, but mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of the other cases. Well, that's that's actually what I'm talking about. But yeah. yeah. So side question, because you're like right in the midst of going to cert right now, right? What's your whole week been like this whole week? You know, you're basically almost ready to, to ship your game. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I did say we could talk about that, didn't I? Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know. Oh, God. Uh, what's my week been like? It's hard to remember past a couple of days ago. I, I mean, it's not like... It's not like I'm working from when I wake up to go, when I go to sleep. That's actually not it. It's just things keep coming up and it's hard to explain. It's like, um, so I'm doing something called compliance testing where they make sure that that the game will pass cert on Xbox, right? Like this is a special kind of QA mm -hmm. just for Xbox or each of the platforms, right? Yeah. Um, and they'll find something like there's some requirement where if a person plugs in a second controller, they have to have a screen that comes up and is like, do you want to change users? So then I have to go in and I have to make a screen and Elmore has to, my programmer who's doing the port has to hook up that screen. But then obviously I'm also coming out in nine languages, right? So I have to go get that. I have to go send an email and be like, oh shit, sorry, there's a new string. We have to get translated into the eight other languages. Oh. Um, so every change becomes a multi-day thing. And every oh change gosh. has massive impacts. And, and there's just been a lot of loops like this that are hard, that you don't see coming, where something from one platform will affect another one. I mean, I'm down, I'm pretty close at this point. I can pull up my list right now. Uh, <laughs> like, I'm done with the PS4 port. That one was the Oof, easiest. Congratulations. Yeah. In order, I like, I can rank, coffee. I can very easily rank them from easiest to hardest. Mm. Like, hardest. Please do. Hardest for a million reasons is Stadia. Just like, uh, I mean, that shouldn't be a surprise, right? Like, this is a making. That is a surprise to me. I, I thought that'd be a lot more straightforward. Oh, I mean. Anyways, we don't no, have to. No, we, don't have to we dig should into go that. into it because it it is interesting why it's difficult. Why is Stadia the hardest? Is it mostly well, because they just don't have a lot of uh, written written word yet? Like, oh, good lord, no! Loads of documentation. Uh, oh, okay. So, why is Stadia the hardest? Um, so, things that I didn't expect that I had to do on Stadia are things like if somebody plugs in an Xbox controller, then I have to have all the hints move over from being the Stadia controller to the Xbox controller. If they plug sure. in a PS4 controller, I have to have all the hints move over to those, those remappings. I have to find a way, which means I have to find a way to detect what kind of controller you're using. Um, yeah. I have to support on this one platform, both mouse and keyboard and any given controller and hot swapping between them. I have to make sure that the game looks just as good and is as readable on a phone as it is on the computer, which I haven't done yet. Like I'm trying to figure out how to detect if you're on a phone so that I can change the scaling of the UI if you're on a phone, because obviously the UI needs to be bigger. And I've already figured that out for Switch. Like I can scale the UI dynamically to be bigger on the Switch because you have to, so you can read it if it's. That's a big thing. ask, though. That's, I think that's the ask of Stadia. Like that's what the what the platform is is a game that can run on any screen, right? That's so. I so, I just realized like yeah no you're totally like, I never thought that was gonna be the thing that was difficult, and then I realized now that yeah if you switch over, you know, you're playing Assassin's Creed on your phone all of a sudden. That the UI kind of needs to change. Completely to change. Oh man, see, I don't. Ugh. And there's, that, there's other ugh. things too. Like Google is a company with certain. Um, okay, this is a story that makes me look bad, but it is a good story. <laughs> Google has certain requirements because they are a, a public company that mostly, like, at their core, wants to do good, right? Like they're good. Um, yeah. And one of those requirements is that. Uh, uh, keyboard remapping, which is something I didn't anticipate having to do and wasn't in my contract or anything. So I just wasn't going to do it. And so mm -hmm. I, I requested a waiver. This has been a, this has been a thing that's been going on for a bit. It's like, mm. uh, I'm one, I'm one person. I like, I'm a solo developer. I, I don't think I can do key remapping. And they're like, but you have to. I was like, oh, well, well, 
you know, like the, the way that this is laid out is you can play with your left hand or your right hands. Like there, you know, I've got all these different controller configurations you can choose from, but that's not good enough. Well, the thing is, and I'm like trying really hard to negotiate and I got them down to, okay, what if there's a patch within three months of launch that adds key remapping? Because the thing is, if I add key remapping now, I have to, if I add key remapping now, that's another thing that I have to get localized into nine different languages because now you have the thing, you don't think about it, but every time you add a UI screen, like not yeah. only is it just making sure that it doesn't break everything else and that it's okay with all these other builds, uh, and it's figuring out how to get the hint prompts when you're in game to show you the correct hint key, which is like, I don't even know how I would do that. So we're talking about- I a think Unity has a plug, like somebody made a plugin on the marketplace for that. Yeah, but, I the thing is, like, the hints are, the way that I tell people, like, here's the key you hit is with a, a fucking texture on a piece of paper in the game. Right. So I'm, I didn't think that through when I set that up. So yeah, you have to have some kind of Boolean structure or like a... Not just a bool. If they can remap the key, I have to have a, yeah. fuck, a way to put the correct key on that butt on the it texture so yeah so i didn't think that through all the way right so like <laughs> so, <laughs> so like, i'm like this is the worst part of game development it's like really cool being indie but then when you realize you got to do all the things that the programmers have to do late game is like not fun so, and i'm sure most of them are just sitting back laughing now I, I'm sitting, like, I know and i'm sitting here like all right all right this is fine this is gonna be fine but i i, I do you know the depths i went to when we were at pax i actually had an emergency meeting with tara people who are listening may not know who tara is we worked with yeah. her she was in qa irrational she mm -hmm. moved over to microsoft she spearheaded the um adaptive controller and now she's, she's at Mixer right now, right? Yeah, it, it, she's on the Mixer team. She works heavily with the adaptive controller. And I'm like, Tara, I have this really inclusive key binding thing that's great for, for you know, disabled people. I don't know the right terms. I'm sorry. I'm a bad person. But, like, I, I, like I, I've got a decent one, right? She's like, yeah. She's like, well, Google kind of wants me to add button remapping, but I don't think I need, or key remapping, but I don't think I need to do that. She's like, oh, you do. It's like, Tara, I need you to be a friend right now, dear. <laughs> could, could, how, if you were trying to wiggle out of this, what language would you use to convince somebody? <laughs> I'm like trying to have her help me craft an email to get me out of rem remapping. And Tara's just like, Gwen, you bitch, no. <laughs> just like, well, like, you know, Tara is like, she's the poster for... I know. She's like, I'm not going to help you do this. And I'm like, what, what if... Well, you know what? what it would really sunk it in for me. And I know Mike is already planning on doing keep well i think so we might be lucky just in the fact that i think there's a store plugin that somebody made that automatically does that stuff for unity uh but That's... i imagine somebody might have done that for unreal and if they didn't you might be able to make it and then sell it on the marketplace <laughs> it's but not they... there's no money in selling any of that stuff in the marketplace right now and and it's like and the thing is it's an insane amount of work but it's not just that it's an insane amount of work it's that if I make this new UI screen, I have to A, make sure it doesn't break all the other platforms, and then B, I have to get it localized, <laughs> which means, which doesn't sound like a lot, but I'm having a fight right now with my localization company. And just the, like, also I need these 10 more strings localized, which is just input device. And then you have to make sure that input device, which is going to be about 14 times longer than you would expect in German, still shows up on your goddamn UI. And this is my life. Like, this is what this these last few weeks Ugh. have been. It's just things like this on loop, right? Like, uh, oh my gosh. The... And you're paying people to like localize your stuff as well. So like, yeah, but you have to do the input, right? Or, yeah. or are they hooked into your like? So the way that localization works in Unreal is you, they've got a thing that will gather up all those text strings. Yeah. And, and I thought that was amazing because it was so easy. You just click a button. Um, you've identified every text, every string of text that you need localized or not. You you flip a bool on that text. They've got like a text object. It's like needs to be localized, doesn't. The whole mm -hmm. interface for all this I learned in like half a day. I was really impressed with how well Unreal handles this. Right. But th what it outputs is just each and every string in a random order, right? So right, it's not. Yeah, it's just all gathered. So you, you so, there's no real rhyme or reason to so, most of it. Yeah. So and sometimes. It, things just don't make sense out of context or you get things where it's like um there's this one character one point where rue says what is this in three different dialogue boxes well that those words are different 
but they're in different strings. And there's another place where I did something similar, but and also used the word is, but that is has to be a different is in different languages. <laughs> so, so because like, I don't know. Reasons. You're like not sure. You're like trying to connect the dots. So, like you're yeah. connecting the Pepe Sylvia like strings on so, the wall. <laughs> so the first pass that they did of the translations came back and I had playtesters play it. And they're like, this fucking makes no sense. <laughs> like it's terrible. The one of the characters in Japanese, apparently they just uh, changed her gender between he and she just constantly. Oh, wow. Uh, like, so I had to get another pass done and, and we're talking about it. And this isn't some of there's also other things that happened with the localization company. I think they could have done a better job in certain ways. There's certain mm. things where like there's just punctuation missing in places and stuff. And yeah, my so. my wife was um helping uh translate Chinese novels into English recently uh, with a friend of hers, and the friend would do the initial translation, and then my wife would be doing like the editing, and like she's just like, this doesn't make any sense. Why would they be talking about this? Something sad just happened, and you're like. They jump for joy here. They're like, <laughs> there's like bad translation stuff where like it literally makes no sense. Yeah. And then you're like, <clears throat> you're like, we need to look, we need to like talk to some people about what this word means. And it's like, oh no, they weren't jumping for joy. They were like weeping. Yeah. You know, and it's like, <laughs> there's like, <laughs> and you get into with Chinese, you get into weird politics too that you I didn't anticipate, right? Because like, there's if you talk to people on the internet, like on Twitter. They will mm -hmm. swear up and down that um, the, so there's traditional Chinese and there's simplified Chinese, right? Yeah. They'll swear up and down that like you should have both or that one is more important than the other, but that's because the people on Twitter are probably from Hong Kong, like, mm. where there's a what smaller the people from Hong population. Kong generally like. I, I think it's just different. Like one mm. one's I don't know much about this, but like I'm one assuming segment, that they like the shorthand. Uh, simplified Chinese is the one everybody uses, like because. Gotcha. The other thing is, like, when you're looking at cost per word, Chinese is by far the most expensive. Uh, Chinese, Korean, Japanese are more expensive than the Oof. English. Just, like, the cost, because you pay for translation by word. Right. Uh, so are you, you translating into Chinese? Yeah. Ooh. Oh, that's all I'll say. Yeah, I'm doing eight <laughs> languages. I The one I didn't need to do that I chose to do was Portuguese. Um, Brazilian Portuguese. Gotcha. I mean... I just am bullish on Brazil. I don't know why. It's just like, kind of like... They can... Eh, I don't want to like overreach there, but I feel like if you do it into Spanish, there's a lot of things that kind of like share. Perhaps. Um, there's a lot of people in Portugal. Much. We translated the Flame of the Flood into Portugal and we saw a pretty sizable number of people use it. So oh, that's pretty, pretty cool, actually. The The standard is e frigs, is English, French, uh, sorry, e figs. English, French, yeah. I is Spanish, German, <laughs> yep. Italian. Sorry, I is Italian. E yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like um, when we were working on Payday, we had a good sizable number from Russia that I was pretty, I was pretty surprised about. Mm -hmm. um, we used to start making character packs for like specific countries, mm -hmm. uh, which was kind of fun and, that's, and that's very pretty, interesting. That's pretty standard, and you'll see things like. But the thing is, just because you have people in a certain region that really like to play the game, like, for instance, there's no... Never translate your game into Dutch, even if you have a shit ton of people that play it, that um, they'll just want to play the English version anyway because they don't like shitty translations. <laughs> like, because they, they would rather play the language, play the game, and they... If you... There's certain regions that are bilingual and they just want to play the, the game in the language that it was made in. Sure. Because there's certain things like puns aren't going to translate, right? Right. Yeah, so, sure. Yeah, yeah. This is my life. <laughs> well, so uh, on your list of things that you... Do you still have like a lot of things left for CERT for Xbox? For Xbox? Um, well, that, that's what Xbox I thought you were working the, on right now. Uh, no. Today, I, I want to prove to the good people at Google that I have a plan for, for key remapping and possibly button remapping. And I want to... I, I want to take that in a branch far enough along that I can be like, look, I really can do this. Here's what I'm going to do. Can you please wait mm -hmm. for this? And then I'll try to get it done for launch. And if not, I'll get it done soon afterwards. Like that's my plan today is to get that done. Um, I think we're, we're simultaneously the most and the least worried about Stadia because Stadia, I'm launching on all platforms other than Stadia, October 17th, mm -hmm. which means I have to submit 
I have to submit the switch by September 17th or get a waiver. And I'm not confident I can get a waiver to submit late for cert on the switch because mm. Apple Arcade is dropping. And with that, a shit ton of switch titles are going through. Um, oh, really? Yeah, because Apple Arcade, those games are coming out on cross platform. And so I am competing. Oh, I didn't know that. Competing with far more famous indies right now for. for um, oh my God, I need to look up Apple Arcade. I haven't heard anything really about it except from you. Yeah, it's coming out on the 19th. On the night September nineteenth? Yeah. Uh, no, no, it's coming out in four days. This week. Okay. Apple Arcade, all fifty games. Yeah. And you're one of those? No. No. No, but those games, a lot of them are coming out on cross platform, so they'll also be on Steam, they'll also be on Switch, and so forth. So interesting. Th- there is a lot of games dropping right now in the near future, oh my dropping gosh. into cert. There's a lot you. of unique looking games in I know. here. I told you this was coming. Like, I mean, this was my biggest fear is the, I, I was worried Stadia would drop a, just as many titles too, that this, the end of the year would just be crap tons of indie games. In a way, you it mean is. in, um, in December-ish? Uh, Stadia, I think they're announced, what have they announced? I think they've said it's coming out in November, but not exactly when. Okay. Pretty sure they yeah, said Yeah, I think, um, like I'm worried, like I would almost rather not be caught up in the in the group releases i don't know what do you think is better do you think it's better to like be a part of like a big group release oh it depends right like if you you want to come out you don't want to be the person launching on the like a premium game on the iphone at the same time apple arcade drops and everybody's getting one month free of apple arcade games so everybody's well if you were a part of the apple arcade but if you're part of it then you're getting paid handsomely by apple then yeah yeah I of course yeah you know, I was that, that's of fantastic like they're paying very oh, well sayonara for wild hearts i'm excited to try that out yeah yeah no, it's a lot of, well they even have sega up here doing like some racing game thing yeah there's a lot of games coming out they look good oh my gosh it's too many games man i told you this was coming i've been saying it i've been saying it to anybody who would listen <laughs> You're like, this year, next year, you're like, is, next you're year's like photoshopped. Play. There's like you're outside your cardboard hut, and you're like, there's too many games. Like your little no, cardboard no, just, this, too just many games. this year. Just I felt like there was gonna be a shit ton of triple I titles right in Q4 this year, and I knew I was launching in Q4 because I knew I was gonna be on Stadia. So I can't launch later than Stadia launches. So I pushed just mm. up as close to Stadia as I could. I actually thought like sh- if shit hits the fan, I would slip my launch date to be this to line up with Stadia. But ideally, because I'm not getting paid to be a steady exclusive, mm-hmm. ideally I launch beforehand so that I avoid any rush that happens there. Also, I think I'm ready for the most part. I'm ready. Uh, I've got one bug on the Switch I've got to figure out, which is... You've uh, got this. Yeah. I've, I've got two bugs. N- neither of them will stop cert on the Switch. They're just cosmetic issues I wish I could fix specifically for the Switch. Gotcha. So I could... If... Sh- the shit hits the fan rather than ask for a waiver i'm just going to submit to cert and then make a patch that fixes those two cosmetic bugs and how, that'll just be what how happens. long do you have to be submitted before you launch on like a store for example for like for for switch is it like a month ahead of time they have or? exactly a month unless you get a waiver yeah exactly a month okay. so you have to you have to upload and your after- rom and request a cert at least one month before launch And then they have to like probably get back to you within like a week. And then they're like, okay, we're going to queue this up. And then Mm -hmm. they're going to look through it. You know, my favorite thing about working with Google, every, like all these other platforms, you have to figure out their interface. Everything to do with Google uses Google stuff. So like the way you schedule your cert is on Google calendar. So it's like, I don't have to. Yeah, of course they do that. Yeah. Or like, like we're talking right now on Google Hangouts. You know who else I do this with? Anytime I have a Google meeting, we just use like, it's crazy because all of their everybody else, I have to learn the new software for yeah, every fucking person. But with Google, it's so easy because it's like, oh, I do this anyway. That's great. Yeah, it's just it's just Google. That's it's the just, one. Just Google that's things. one of the few good things. Bad things is they're uh, very adamant that there will be about query mapping, which is actually kind of beautiful. 
I mean, I think I don't think that our game would be able to get away without having keyboard mapping because mm -hmm. a lot of first person shooter people play weird on their keyboards like a lot um, play super strange keyboard setups like you'd think that most people would just do WASDA but or like the arrow keys but a lot of people do like weird setups like windows key z alt space like <laughs> like for movement or like uh like one guy at raven he used to um i let him use my computer once to play a portal level that i was working on and he remapped all my keys and they saved on the cloud oh. and he had move was on left click so go forward was on left click and he just remapped everything so strange. It's time for new friends. And when I sat down, I was like, what the fuck? And ever since then, I disabled the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> like, I literally just, I haven't gone back. <laughs> like, I disabled cloud such a long time ago. So that keyboard, things like that wouldn't happen again. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, that's silly. It's time for new friends. All right, I think we should wrap up the show and then take it to questions for Twitter people. Yeah, sure. Um, I think that's, I mean, that's good. I mean, so, you know, your game's coming out pretty soon. and One month you know, and two days, which is why days. I'm oh my certain gosh. tomorrow. Yeah. Are you going to do like a, are you going to do like a launch party in Boston with the Boston Indies or anything like that? I don't know. It's hard to say because I have the launch and then I have the launch immediately afterwards on Stadia. I mean, I want a party. I'm tired. I, I think it's important to to enjoy that moment. Yeah, but that's just like, another thing I have to plan. <laughs> somebody who's a Boston indie that's listening right now, you set up a set up a get together so that Gwen can enjoy her game. It could be a surprise party, you know. <laughs> surprise launch have party. To be, yeah, a surprise launch party. All right, work. I'll I'll hold my breath for that. But thank you for chatting with me. Mojica. Yeah, man. yeah, that was fun. It was fun. It's good times. This has been Indie Gwen time. Frey and Jason Mojica, and you've been in the dialogue box. Bye, everybody. All right, and that's how we'll end the podcast. And now we will okay. stop ignoring the chat. <laughs> was that good? I didn't. Yeah, that's a, that's a really long podcast. Holy shit, there's a lot of people here. How that's... long was it? Yes, yeah, somebody rated us. I'm going to oh, go right. up a little bit. I'm going to go up a little bit. Who rated us? Their name was Jessica Mack. Oh, shit, Jessica Mack. Is she still here? I oh, don't know. She's cool. I haven't streamed in so long. She's cool. She streams like um, she's doing a game entirely in C++. Like, that's a person. I'm looking forward to that game, but watching her make that game is almost more fun. I'm trying to go to her profile because I think I know that name and I might even follow her on Twitter. Jessica Mack. Yeah, why can't I click on her profile? That's lame. Um. Yeah, no, that was really cool. Yeah, she she rated with like forty people, yeah, forty eight she, people. She's awesome. I like her. Um, <laughs> I haven't spoken to her in an age. I hope she's cool. Yeah, the uh, I haven't streamed much. I should stream pathetically trying to set up keyboard mapping, but I'm concerned I, think I will when, curse a lot. So the thing that we didn't get to, and maybe it's like more appropriate, like once you're done launch, but like. I honestly think it would be fun if you streamed your prototyping stuff. Cause like, like when you're thinking about your next game, hmm. I, th I think that would be fun. Cause I love that process. I think honestly, Twitch like has laws against streaming drug use. So not kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't know. You're, so, <laughs> you're just like, you put like a blindfold on. <laughs> uh, yeah. That would be, that'd be make a performance out of it. Here's how, here's how games are prototyped. <laughs> I mean, I streamed the figuring out. I, I streamed the very early stuff for Kine, actually. Oh like, yeah. Yeah. Like. Yeah, I think that'd be fun. I mean, shit. Like, I don't know. The other day, I jumped into Unreal and prototyped like a shield thing that like absorbed like damage, and it was so much fun to do. And I wish I I was streaming it, but I was worried that I had forgotten enough about Blueprint that when I got in, it would just look like I'm flopping around. But in but I ended up just riding a bike again. It was it was nice. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, it's it's hard to say. It's hard to say what's fun to stream and what's not fun to stream. I haven't been able to stream at all lately, and I've fallen way out of the habit just because, like, I'm not allowed to show you a Switch dev kit. I can, sure. Like, I'm not allowed to sh like the stuff I'm doing now. I'm not allowed to show it. I can probably show this. This is a Stadia controller. Everyone's seen it at this point. Um. Do they? Do you know how much Stadia those are going to cost? 
Uh, I think it's on the internet that they've got like, uh, what do you call it? The Founders Pack. Shit, you would think I would know that, wouldn't you? I don't. <laughs> so the, the Founders, I found out about the Founders Pack when the world found out about the Founders Pack. That's the other side yeah. of like, so I'm on these new platforms, which is cool, but I'm also like the least important person on these platforms, right? Like I'm the solo <laughs> indie dev, nobody gives. I'm like, that's cute, we got Gwen. But like, they're mostly concerned with making sure that the AAA people know what's going on because those people matter. Um, the only reason I'm like, how do I put it? Another problem we have with Stadia right now is something called the Vulcan Lair, which I don't understand. Um, I made a bunch of jokes about Star Trek and then Elmore told me to shut the hell up. But like there's <laughs> uh, there's like a, a new rendering thing, Vulcan. And uh, I okay, I, I think, I'm not a programmer, I th it, I, nobody explained this to me, but I've listened to programmers. And I think it's like how you got DirectX and you got like, the other one like now there's what was also, the rtx no, no it was direct x and it was um g the, the nvidia one the you've lost me already i, I have fucking, no idea it's the what, rendering what, shit that the programmers bitch about sure 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 yeah, sure whatever like the the two different ways you render there's a third one i think called vulcan i think anyway it doesn't matter there's a rendering thing and it's a pain in the ass open gl I mean, people are saying Thank open you. gl yes open gl now there's also vulcan oh and there's metal that's right i've heard of metal I listen to programmer streams and retain nothing. <laughs> Here's the, the takeaway is like, so there's half of the, I want to say about half the games that are launching on Stadia are Unreal Engine games. So uh, we're mostly relying on Epic to get the engine to port. And from what I understand, like we, we were confused because we were told that the the base game, you know, a shooter game, made sure. it through CERT on Stadia last week, which means we should be able to make it through Stadia with CERT with our game this week because Kine is written in a scripting layer on top of the engine. There's no way it could possibly... Right. I'm not doing anything to the rendering code. Right. But right now we are getting problems in the mm. Vulcan with validation. Ooh. And Somebody the, at Epic needs to I've, jump in and save I've the heard day. Words. Uh, so we're Elmore's been trying to figure out if this is like our problem or their problem. And I think at the end of the day, he's a lot more freaked out than I am because I'm like, look. At the end of the day, if like there's somebody is going to bend, either Epic is going to figure it out, or Google is going to, and at which. And until they do, if, if if nobody bends, then half of the launch titles don't make it onto Stadia. So somebody between Epic and Google is going to bend and figure out what's going on. They'll either figure it out, they'll they'll come up with a solution, and we'll all be fine. Like there's it's usually Nvidia, I think, is the one that has to fix their graphics cards. I don't think it's a graphics cards issue. Oh, okay. I think it's a something else. Yeah, issue. I'm not I'm not cultured in these in these know. in these discussions. I'm less concerned, basically. Yeah. Uh, because I think I I believe that these people will figure it out. Not for not for my sake, but for the sake of the other titles. I feel like we've got a collective bargaining thing going on, being Unreal Engine games. Yeah, I think so too. They're they're sort of like your, they're sort of like the hey we we got Gwen over here and she needs uh she needs uh some some programming help here. We gotta break your legs. We gotta break your legs if you don't help Gwen out. Well, it's hard to know too. Like uh. It could just be, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I'm not going to wax philosophical on this because I'm not a programmer. Like, I don't know what the deal is. I'm, I'm, I got enough to worry about with the key bindings. <laughs> I got I got my own problems. I got to figure yeah. out key remapping. I worry about, yeah, we'll have to see because like, there's a lot of stressful stuff coming down the road for Mike. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to, we'll be able to get like a mixture of like things off the marketplace and just kind of shortcut a lot of that. Like, I'm really worried about that. Um, but anyway, let me see. So does anybody have any um, specific questions for indie devs in chat right now? There's a lot of people here. I'm sure somebody's got, like, a few extra, like, off-topic questions that they want answered or anything like OpenGL that. OpenGL is the one that's being deprecated. Thank you. I know I'd heard about this ages ago. Oh, you were saying it's being deprecated. I know there was, there was something. I knew there was a reason people were mad about this. That's probably because DirectX is like the hotness, and then they've got is RTX, it? and then. I thought OpenGL was the hotness. I don't 
remember that being the case. I don't know. It's plausible. Vulcan is the future. Well... <laughs> Vulcan is the future. <laughs> now we know. Vulcan is the future. Vulcan's yeah. my now right now, apparently. So... We will find hey, out. here's a here's a side question. Yes. Um... Now that things are kind of slowing down, sort of, um, have you thought about jumping into like a game jam or anything like that? Uh, I mean, I'll probably think about that later on. I mean, I did. But we haven't quite hit the hurry up and wait phase. There keeps being these things. So I've still got like eight to ten hours of work to do a day. There was a while there where I didn't. Mm -hmm. And I started kind of prototyping the next thing. Or just thinking deeply about what I want in my life like right. all of it you know when you like literally all of it like i'm like to the the span of things i think about go from like all right i'm 32 am i gonna have kids or not so like what do i want because when you think about your game you're talking about the next two to three years of your life so you've got to yep. like set up <laughs> yeah kids is a big discussion as well yeah. uh and I kind my of, wife and i've been going through that discussion yeah you know i'm i reached a point I realized this a couple years back that I couldn't worry about everything at, at once. And so I put, uh, it, it, it's kind of stupid, but I write in my calendar when to think about things. So if I had think about kids in my calendar for, at the time I thought I was shipping in October, uh, for October this, this year, I was supposed to start thinking about kids. Cause, and then every time in the last two years while I've been working on Khan, if I thought about kids, I'd be like, nope, that's scheduled for October, 2019. <laughs> <laughs> Like, you're not allowed to think about great, that. Man. And that that's like the only way I stay sane, right? Like, so. That's actually really crazy. I should probably start doing that because I my brain is just going like a mile a minute, like all the time, just like just trying to figure out like it's no, like, I, so many different things. And like if you were to schedule a time to do it, honestly, it used to be in Sweden. It used to be every day because I never bought a Swedish phone while I was there, which meant that I couldn't use Internet on my phone when I was on the bus and stuff. Uh -huh. So I used to take that time and I did it on purpose, but I used to take that time to self reflect and come up with new ideas for design or whatever. And, and I found like a weird sense of like, once you schedule it, it becomes easy because if you don't schedule it, then it, it is allowed to interrupt you when you need to be focused and in a flow state. Yeah. So if you're trying to get into a flow state, if you're like, I need to figure out key remapping, but you're worried about some other thing, what am I going to do with this next game? Where does this game fit into like some kind of arc of my life or some kind of other weird ass heavy shit? Right. Then you can't get into a flow state. And so the way you get around that is you schedule time to think about certain things or about everything. You just so the point is to give yourself a reason why you can't think about that right now because there's so many times in game development when you need to focus on a very specific problem and if yeah, you yeah, yeah. you can't constantly be at the you know bird's eye view of your life right so you need to mm, schedule sure. times to be at the bird's eye view of your life and times when you're not otherwise you'll never do the work that you need to get done that's a good point actually i i really like that idea i mean i mean i did that like a few times and it worked really well. I don't know why I never continued to do it. Maybe I just, I got stuck thinking about all the stuff again. And then it's just like, oh yeah, I didn't schedule that yet. So I mean, now it, I'm going to think about all the things. It when you're not stressed out and you can just kind of, because there's times in your life when it's easier to just do all of it and you you have no problem getting to like a, a state. My my best days, the days when I'm my most like happy peak, peak when is like when I wake up and I have a task and I know it's a hard task, but I know what I need to do and I sit down and I do it. And the day flies and you're just working, right? Yeah. And those are the best days. Um, For sure. And so optimizing to have as many of those as possible is something I try to do. And yeah. usually I can, and some days just can't be those days. Like some days you wake up and you're just like in a bad mood or some shit, right? Mm -hmm. And so for those days, I, 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 whenever possible, I don't schedule things. But once life gets stressful, it reaches a point where it's you just need to be like, you know what, I, uh, I desperately need to get this problem done. There's these other things that are eating me, and then you just schedule time to think about those other things. So it, yeah. it depends on where you are. Depends. No, for sure. I think uh, the one instance of that recently that happened for me was like I knew that I we needed to get like a breath of all the levels for the game done. Mm -hmm. um, so just knowing that. I have three days to make a whole layout oh, yeah. really helped me 
that's schedule exactly what I needed to do that day, what I was going to do for the next day. Mm -hmm. And like, I think, yeah, it just destroyed it. It was, it felt so good. It, it's one of those things where you have to get a sense for when it's the right time to do that. And when it's really, really not the right time to do that too. Right. Like there's certain yeah. times it's good to have, I will have a, a finished demo that I will show with this event or in three days I will have this done. Right. Yeah. And you kind of have to come up with those ad hoc. You don't want to overly schedule these things because that kind of interrupts your creativity too. It'll yeah, it'll make you start feeling a little um, anxiety for sure. Like having a whole bunch of tasks gets me down. I think if I can just focus on like the one important thing for that day, um, I can be super. Like I can just go to town on it. But like when when we got back from PAX, it was like I've got like ten things that I need to do just getting back from PAX and it was like got to talk to all these people got to do this I got to do that got to write this interview thing I've got to finish this thing and then it was like I need to talk to, to Mike about these three different enemy types that I want got, and then also need to fix you know mm -hmm. and it just and I hate I hate the fact that like Mike is probably overworked right now as well so just being like hey I really need this one thing fixed <laughs> can like really grade, I think, uh, on him as well. Yeah. You and know, also the thing that you think is the most important may not be the thing that he he agrees is the most important and he's probably right. Like, yeah. There's a lot of things that we we discuss that are like, like generally speaking, I only ask for a level editor like tweak or fix or addition if it's going to save us on the level design side like an hour of time or like, 10 minutes, you know, by just clicking a button, for example, mm -hmm. like that kind of stuff. Like, it's like, yeah, that's a priority that we can sort and then he can address it when he needs to. But like, so uh, generally you... speaking, I've never been like, hey, this would be cool if we had this. It's always like, nope, this is going to be a great function that's going to save me like, I don't know, 10, 10 to 15 minutes. And then you keep you compound all of these different changes over time. And it's like now we're saving like days you know versus before so yeah. it yeah so do you do you think a lot about how you can save mike time like do you come up with strategies for that because it sounds like if you're in a situation where one of you is way more work than the other one right on the one hand he doesn't have the, it takes energy to offload something to somebody else ideally you can grab something that is coming down the pipe that he's worried about but hasn't started on yet and take it from him i yeah. know like uh, this gets easier later on when there's more administrative tasks either of you can do like setting up store pages dealing with the localization company so forth but like yeah uh, things that i'm in now right i don't know where you're earlier in development so it's a lot harder yeah we're, we're definitely like i i try and find stuff that i know will help him out so for example right after the kickstarter and after dreamhack or like during dreamhack i got this sense that like he wasn't going to be able to finish all the character models in time. We had like planned like 20 or something characters. And uh, I looked at, I, I sent out like a tweet, like, Hey, I'm looking for character stuff. And we actually got a, a really awesome guy um, from Italy who reached out and was like literally the first and perfect person for the job. And I went ahead. I was like, Mike, I found this guy. I know you're going to be really busy doing coding stuff for the level editor let's get this guy in here he seems really cool and he's going to do all these characters for you and then all you'll have to do is rig them for the animations and you know put the rest of it in because like a lot of it does it's like the least fun one of our part. what was that all you'll have to do is the grunt work yeah well he's actually really good at doing system like system work just like knocking it out like yeah, one I at know. a time I always um, find skinning to be zen, and also if you get your pipeline down right, you can do it a lot faster. You can transfer yeah. weights between characters and so forth. So, like, just trying to, like, divvy out some of those responsibilities to help him out and to alleviate some of that stress mm -hmm. um, was important. And we're I think we're also going to do that with the guns. Like, I, I convinced him, like, if he just does the block out for the gun and we get, like, a good feeling for it, that then we could send off the high poly to somebody else, mm -hmm. and then he can finish the texture work the way he wants to so it's like cohesive and, and everything um but there's a there's a lot of little things like that that we're trying to you know we try and offload where possible because you know it's a lot of work and we're doing we're pretty ambitious so i think the the less that he has to worry about doing something like that the better 
uh, and then we're just you know we're just trying to work as 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 much as possible trying to get everything done mm -hmm. i don't know i'll be interested it, to hear interesting... postmortem because people break this out so differently and people approach it so differently yeah it's it's an interesting thing i mean yeah it's just yeah it's just one of those things we'll have to see how it we'll have to see how it turns out i mean i think you know it's different when you're solo and you can kind of divvy out your own tasks but then you're also like i imagine for like a good portion of it you're you're also like oh i should probably really do that myself you know yeah i mean i did that <laughs> i i chose environment art ui art specific things that i needed i knew were my weaknesses and I worked for, I hired Surface Digital for that. For me, it was easy. It was like, if I could do it, I did do it. Like, I just picked, mm -hmm. I didn't divvy out anything that I, unless I felt like I had to. Like, if I didn't divvy out the environment art, the environment art wouldn't have been what it is. It would have been like, I can show you a stylized gray box, basically. And mm -hmm. if I didn't divvy out the ports, then I wouldn't have ported the game because I don't know C++. Like, so, so it wasn't like I had to make any real decisions. Um, the, what did I divvy out? Well... My boyfriend is the one that is talking to Sony, Xbox, and Switch. I will say that. Mm -hmm. uh, just because, like, he sensed I stopped sleeping much. And uh, he was like, he, I would stressfully tell, like, it reached a point where I started talking to him over dinner about all the things that were stressing me out. And he just started writing them down. And then he made, he got Jira, which is a bug thing. And he's just like, you know what? Yep. I know you're worried you're going to lose some of this stuff. So I'm just going to start putting it into jira like he, that's interesting he set up jira he made bugs for me i was mad about that at first i'm not mad about it anymore it's it was good in the end like two, he, about what has it been yeah about two and a half months ago was when this started when he just like i think he sensed that i was about to lose my mind about two and a half months ago and he just started going like mm, that's awesome i'm just gonna start taking notes over dinner that's super nice actually yeah. uh, and now that's fantastic yeah and then he he's actually the one that's um like he, he's basically my publisher on those three platforms. He does all the work for, for that stuff. Because there's so much documentation to go through just to do all I of it. Know. You know? And it's hard enough with the new storefronts. The old storefronts, like, they're more established. There's documentation. You know what to do. It's, you know. But, uh, and it's something he can manage in bugs where he'll be like, Gwen, you have until Friday to get this bug done. Otherwise, we can't cert on the Switch. He's the one that told me this morning. I like, would totally forget about something like that. Like, if somebody wasn't, like that's also sort of my job too. Like Mike just kind of does, and then I'm like, "Hey, we need this by this date," and I'll I'll say like, "If we're gonna do this, then these need to be done by these dates," and like I'll I'll sort of take that like into consideration a lot of the times, and I'll kind of ping Mike like, "Hey, these are the dates we need to shoot for," and you know that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, that's that's to... sort of just one of those things that like I've just taken upon myself to do yeah he did that really carefully and gently too because i <laughs> i know you know my feelings on producers and generally bug trackers and shit and i was like i don't think we need this <laughs> but uh he i think we're using trello right now it's just like i i added the trello bot for slack so all you have to do is like slash add in like the trello channel or like i think all the channels like certain channels have it hooked in so like editor bugs and then you could just, mm. I literally just type in there and then I'll jump over and paste a screenshot and then we can change the list and like, cause in Slack, everything gets lost, but mm -hmm. like in Trello, you can kind of move cards around and move them over to like done or working on. Yeah. I had a personal Trello that I use for like organizing my thoughts at some, at different points, like especially earlier in a, in a production, it's important to like figure that shit out. We've had a lot yeah. of questions that we've been ignoring, Mojico. Yeah, I realized. So one of the, let me see, I got a question. Uh, let's see. Somebody asked a decent one early on. Let's see. Um, Proteus does not have a demo currently. Uh, Marcos, sorry about that. Um, oh, shit. Marcos Devtober. Hey, dude. Um, the easy questions. The easiest platforms to port for right now. For me, it was Sony. The second easiest was... Uh, Xbox because let me look at let me look at my bugs. Hold on. Second easiest was Xbox. Xbox has a lot more cert requirements that have to do with like pulling out a controller and making sure it works and switching users and they've just got a lot of things that they're very adamant about and those things tend to have knock on effects for the other platforms and there's certain things like um, 
I don't care if you have a keyboard or a controller plugged in. Like I let both work at both times, but uh, if you have, you could technically have both plugged into an Xbox and one could be one user and one could be another user. So there's just a lot of weird shit there. There's just a lot of bugs on the Xbox. We did have one, I don't want to shit on Microsoft here. Um, it's just every time, this is irritating for me because I'm having a fight with my localization company right now. And also I have to be like, I don't like what you did here, but also I fucked up and I need 10 more pretty long strings translated into nine different languages. Like, so it's kind of hard to do that. Uh, whereas the problems I had on Sony, I didn't really have any problems at all that weren't also on the Switch and the Xbox. The only one thing Elmore took it upon himself to fix this was there was a, a three second lag anytime you beat a, a puzzle before the next puzzle loaded. And it wasn't a hitch, it wouldn't freeze, but it wouldn't load the next puzzle for three seconds after you completed one puzzle, only Oof. on the PS4. And I didn't think it was that bad. I got used to it really quickly, but Elmore made it, it he needed to make saves asynchronous and he did. Um, he took it upon himself to do that and it's a lot better because of it. Anyway, Sony's done. I can, I'm ready to start on the PS4. That one was the easiest, second easiest Xbox, third easiest Switch. There's just more there because it's a more complicated platform. Hardest Stadia so far. It's a new platform, it's harder. They're, they have a lot of process. Um, it's as hard as starting on a console plus phone at the same time, basically. Let's see. That's the order. So is, somebody was asking about um, how do you, any tips for getting attention on uh, for your game on community sites like forums and, and Reddit? Uh, no, I mean, honestly, it, that just comes down to like, how well you present your game i mean obviously if you put together a gif of just menus that probably won't reach the front page of a you know of, of something on reddit you you kind of have to be catchy there's a there's a lot of like craft that goes into how you present your game on like social media but the best way to do it and to get like on reddit and stuff is to generally just you have to start on like there was a really great talk um geez i had it up literally the other day on my uh it was from gdc and it was about how to be discoverable in like 2018 as an indie and essentially the 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 way that it boils down to it is that you need to be on all of the social platforms that you possibly can be posting your work um because you never know which group of social tools is the best to show off your work i mean there's definitely some things that like twitter's better at than instagram than you know uh you know all those other things but like i would say like to to, to reach like reddit and stuff i mean you can definitely have your own subreddit and post on it but like honestly you need to be able to drive traffic to those things yourself and like you know when you post like i don't know so like for example we have like about five thousand people on twitter right now so if we were to post something that was legitimately better than just our normal gifts like an actual playthrough footage of like three minutes of gameplay footage. Some other people will post that just on Reddit for us. We don't have to do that. Um, I think a lot of people tend to, they tend to like scoff when the, when the developer themselves does it for yeah, some reason. I always get, I get, I get a little tickled every now and then when I see somebody else has posted some like gif of, of kind or something, or when yeah. I see people, cause I mean, obviously I go to these, reddits because i'm a fan of games right yeah. so like there's like a puzzle game subreddit and every now and then kind gets mentioned in it and i'm like oh shit hi but i don't say anything i, I love weird. seeing that too it, it it definitely makes you happy like i remember when we did our 12 minute gameplay footage thing i was gonna go post it on reddit but it had already been posted on like a few different uh subreddits and we were just in there answering questions like jumping back and forth um between them and i think to get to the bigger subreddits you kind of need a community around you that will help push that or it's like something that no one's ever seen before that that they find hella interesting um i know there's that one guy that posts those um procedurally generated animation gifs where like it's a giant hawk that attacks a snake and then becomes a snake hawk and then like the guy's jumping on the different snake heads and like Fucking shooting them and they're talking about more like there's there's like an animator that specifically does these really interesting procedurally animated gifs where um 
He's I like mean, a, you just described it. You don't have to describe yeah, it. Again, yeah, yeah, yeah. It I'm trying cool. to think of I'm trying to talk it through in my head where I can describe it in a different way, but there's no other way to describe it. Um I, I have to find it. But yeah, his like his last one with the snake and the hawk got him like a hundred thousand like retweets or likes yeah. or something like that. It's hard to it's know how impressive. that translates into actual sales, is the other thing. Like I, I'm Yeah, I don't think he's things. selling anything either, which is crazy. Yeah. But like it's hard to it's hard to say. And it's easy to feel really defeated when you're I, I don't know how to put it. Like sometimes things are really, really popular on Twitter and then don't sell at all because people really like the gifts, but they don't want to buy the game. Right. Um, that's true for a lot of games or toys. It, it's one of those things where it depends on what's important to you. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a fundamental breakdown in design of your game. And, you know, if you were, if you're honestly thinking about the game itself versus just selling the game. Like you want to make sure the gameplay is, you know, there's, there's, there's a, yeah. I mean, if you're not thinking about the things that really matter, it's going to show in the end. Yeah. That's why, that's why it's a shame. Like, I, I feel for people who want to keep putting their game on steam and looking at wish lists because there, that is to date the easiest way to see, to gauge interest is like mm -hmm. this. Here's a person who will most likely buy this game. They wishlisted it. You know what I mean? I wonder what the, like, there's got to be some kind of statistics. I mean, it's kind of hard because it, it, those are individual stats that only the developer reads. But I'd love to do, like, an anonymous sheet where everybody says, like, after a year, I had 10,000 wishlists. And after two years, I had 20,000 wishlists or, I mean, they, or whatever. They do those drives every now and then. But the thing is, like, it's very difficult to get data from that because different genres of games get different wish list numbers to sales also like, yeah the conversion that, rate is is a lot different also there's how you promoted your game which will be very very different for some things or if your game in early access or not so what about a game that had early access that obviously has to have a completely different wish list to early access to launch pipe than everything else and eventually it breaks down until like very few games can actually compare with each other you know what i mean very few games are the same genre and promoted in the same way and if it was did do that and was successful, doing it again a couple years later isn't necessarily going to get same, you the yeah. same thing. So it's almost, For sure. I don't want to be like defeatist. It's just, I feel like a lot of times people try to divine in the tea leaves certain things about uh, when you have no information at all in an extremely turbulent industry, it becomes extremely tempting and comforting to find some sort of... Uh, to look at the random numbers and, and detect some sort of algorithm, something that'll bring you comfort, something that'll tell you that what you're doing is not crazy. And uh, it's all bullshit. That's my, <laughs> that's my GC talk, ladies and gentlemen. That's your, the <laughs> anyway, Kevin, that was really sweet. Thank you, man. I'm glad you're into it. Oh, and man. Elliot, you should set up a, we're not gonna be streaming much longer. So if you want, I can radio if you're gonna start streaming. If this is Elliot from the Discord, Yeah, it's actually kind of interesting. His people. his note on uh, each upvote is like about 40 to 50 views. Wow. That's kind of cool. I mean, I imagine that's sort of the case. And I imagine every downvote is is ever so slightly yeah. more. I don't know. I, she, I gave a talk at console once and I ended it with Jake Burkett is always wrong. But just to pick on Jake Burkett. But like Jake Burkett has a blog where he tries to divine things based on wish lists. And on the one hand, I think it's really, really good that he does that and it's cool. But on the other hand, I think people derive a lot of meaning from the, his blog. And I'm looking at 10 random scattershot data points. Like he's saying this is the number of sales you'll get based on wish lists based on 10 games. And I'm like, there's just no way that's enough data. Like knowing what I know about games, like there's just no way that's anything other than a random random noise and right i like i mean he says it's consistent i believe him because i'm not a mathematician but i feel like there's just the only people that know this shit for sure is valve right what was who was it the guy who was doing the um i think he worked at epic he had run that steam sergey spy, steam spy? Yeah. yeah i thought that yeah, was I pretty email cool sergey sometimes he's yeah, cool I, 
that must have been like the coolest like undercover like i don't know how many people even knew that he was doing it and that he actually worked at epic but that was no, such he a didn't cool work like at epic at first he was hired by epic oh. and right after he was hired by at epic valve closed the loophole that let steam spy show numbers <laughs> and at the time i was on a podcast and i was like oh i bet epic makes a store and that was several months before they made a store and i'm saying right here and now gwen is always right just, just saying it's like it's i have a conspiracy so theory <laughs> i have a conspiracy theory i think fortnite at the time i said i think how what was it i think valve is shutting down steam spy because sergey went to work at epic and it is a known fact that fortnite is taking off and i think valve is nervous about the numbers that are going to come out very soon about how well fortnite is doing compared about fortnite's users going up like this and uh Dota numbers going down like this and like yeah. TF2 numbers going kind of down like this. Like I think they see the writing on the wall and they see that Sergey was hired and that's why they closed it. Anyway, yeah, they, they closed the loophole very shortly after that. Other conspiracy theory is Chris Hecker launched uh, a game about spies at the same time as uh, Steam Spy got shut down. It could be either one of those. We don't know. <laughs> could be either one. This is actually pretty good. It's unknowable. <laughs> I did the Reddit talk at GDC. Word. Uh, the biggest thing people can do is post self posts and subreddits. Yeah, I they were saying like essentially self posting or self promoting <laughs> is generally frowned upon, and I, I, I discovered that as well when we were we were doing the Kickstarter for well, when I was like trying to like really get it out there. I was literally just posting it as many places as possible. And when I was doing the imager posting, I was trying to post GIFs like pretty much like one a day. I would do it to like our gaming or something like that. And some people got really upset. They were like, you need to stop doing this and blah, blah, blah. Mm. And a lot of people kind of were like, no, you shut up. And and I found that kind of funny. And I kind of did like one of those, like I think the meme at the time was the was the guy walking from San Andreas. It was like, oh shit, here we go again. And I, uh, yeah. I, I posted like our first GIF again but like it was of an elevator opening and a demon spawning in the in the in the front of it and i just put that guy walking out of the elevator like oh shit another proteus gift <laughs> like so Gotta trying to like yeah you you kind of have to i mean cuz like at the end of the day there's like a few people that are going to get mad but like what are you going to do you need to promote your game there's nothing you can do about it like the indie life is yeah, this is all I can do. So I'm, I apologize to those that might be getting offended by me posting my game. But yeah, there's more than one indie life. Needs to happen. My indie life is selling out hard to Epic Game Store and uh, <laughs> doing none of this shit. I don't even have an Instagram. Like, I don't. <laughs> we indie life in the ways that we see fit. I mean, I think what you're doing building a community is like, like the clay model. Uh, it fits so well for your game and for the fact that you want to have a modding community and stuff. So. I respect what you're doing. Yeah. I would I, die. I'm if wondering why is is there is there I don't know, Gwen. I really think that you're missing out on I mean, like obviously different paths. And I think that's what's great mm -hmm. about this setup that's going on right now, but I always I do think that there is something important to like have just to have that little always have a community even if they're you know you're not releasing something yeah uh, like uh, every few weeks i do everything i can like to the True. extent that i can as one human being right yep like I no have, and i you I know and discord, i sometimes i forget discord. that like you know obviously mike and i split you know the the focus so if it was just me making the game by myself i probably wouldn't find any time to do any of that other stuff so yeah, it's, uh... and I mean, we run our businesses the way that we can, right? Like, at the end of the day, Khan is in the black because I run my business differently. Uh, because, and, you know, like, I was at PAX talking to Oculus. Like, I'm already lined in. I don't know what I'm going to do next. I'll figure out what kind of game I want to make, and then I'll figure out how I'll get it funded. And then I'll make the thing I want to make. And most of the games I make are not multiplayer. The games I, well, I've... I mean, I worked on Marvel Heroes in line, but for the most part, the games I play aren't usually multiplayer. Yep. The games I like are short narrative games that, like, I don't think as a gamer, I've been a part, like, I loved Inside. It was my favorite game. I wasn't part of any inside community, right? Like, the games right. I adore generally don't have communities, so it's not something that comes naturally to me or is interesting to me. 
It's true. It's true. I mean, and like most like, of the games that I play right now are multiplayer. So I'm always about that like community style uh, structure. Uh, but yeah, no, I think uh, I think that's a good thing. And I'm 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 excited. Honestly, like I'm excited to see like what you're gonna do next. I'm excited about the games and the way that like the path that you're going is is, next is I such curl a up different in a ball path. And I just shiver like, for like a while. <laughs> That's gonna be what happens next. I'm not excited about that at all. I'm trying you're very like, hard <laughs> not to think about that. <laughs> you're like on today's stream, it's just like a camera pointed at your shower and you're just like huddled in the corner just, <laughs> like like mm. cold that shower you're just like <sighs> that's like today um, on indie life <laughs> a dose of realism yeah we'll figure that out when we have to uh yeah we'll figure that out when we have to you know what was funny is somebody approached me about being part of a panel at gdc and the panel is called how to run a company without ever having a hit game and i was like thanks Asshole. <laughs> That's like, uh I haven't launched kind yet. You could give me some hope here, man. The fuck? Oh my gosh. Did you accept it or no? I thought about it. It is a free GDC badge if you speak, but I think I'll go speak at the animation boot camp again, so I think I'm good. I and really want to do like, no. the level design one if possible, but at the same time, I think it's is it in February or March? Yeah, it's in March, and you have to submit by the end of the month. I'm gonna yeah, submit I think, something. I think I might have here. Should yeah. do a postmortem. I don't know what it'll be yet. I wish I could do that. I wish I could be like, I'm gonna write this after the game launches. Is that okay? Because it's a postmortem on the game. Uh, I'll be speaking in March. The game launches in November. I'll have plenty of time to write this. But GDC's like, nah. Pitch your shit, yeah. bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wonder. I mean, I haven't I haven't okay, done a GDC sure. talk yet, but I'm always intrigued by the level design in a day ones or just the like five minute talks where they just do a quick lesson learned or something on their mind or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like the, the micro talks are always good. I enjoy doing the micro talks. I've done four micro talks now. Uh, for the do you, do you find that interesting to write for? I mean, yes. cause you have to compact everything. It's like writing a tweet, like back in the day when the tweets were just like one, one forty. it's like, okay, well, Cut let it. me just, you write Think down all your that. thoughts and you cut it down to just the important shit, especially for the, um, I usually do t tricks of the trade as well. I usually mm -hmm. do like two talks a year for the last couple of years, but they're sh both good. like two five minute talks and both of them are just cut down to make a very specific point for the most part. Yeah. yeah. I, I did watch, I think there was one that I watched that was yours. That was, that was pretty funny where you basically said the opposite of what you meant to do. <laughs> it was, uh, I was like, man, someone's going to watch this and think that's what they really have to do. <laughs> oh, well, you know, you get humor or you don't. I can't help you here. No, I feel bad because you know that's going to be translated into different languages and then nobody's going to understand what the hell I'm saying. Because like, sarcasm doesn't translate. It's something I talked about with, um, who was it? Uh, Rami back when he was doing his conference. I'm like, there's certain mm -hmm. things that just don't translate, man. Yeah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, no, I would love to do that. I mean, I haven't been I haven't been to a GDC in a while, but those are always so much fun to go to as a developer because all the developers are, you know, like all your buddies just go, you know. Yeah. It's good and, to see it's good to see all the extra rational people and what they're doing now. It's fun. Yeah. Do you remember going to the one did you go to the one when a when the game was coming out for Bioshock, the first the first big release was during GDC? It came out and the, one and a half weeks before GDC. Right, and I then we the, were doing like the whole time we were there. It was party. I think like, what I was that? I remember that one well. Yeah, it was a good time. Did you go to that GDC? Oh, oh fuck yes, I went to that GDC. I wouldn't miss. I've been to the last all of them. I've been. <laughs> I got my first job in the industry at GDC. I've been to the Did last you? ten or eleven. Yeah, <laughs> that's crazy. I mean, I used to live in San Francisco, so it was easier to go. Like, I got my first. I went to GDC when I was in college. Got a job left college early to take that job um was laid off but that job was in san francisco and immediately got another job in san francisco because the studio was at closed within six months oh, so wow. i left college early to get a job and then was laid off with the rest of the studio like within mm. six months and then got another job but i was working out in san francisco for a couple of years and i always went to gc and then when i moved out to boston i try to remember 
I still kept going. There was one year I had to pay my, my own way and that was kind of expensive. And that's why I started speaking. <laughs> so I didn't have to pay for the badge. <laughs> Uh, that's usually, actually pretty smart yeah do a five minute talk don't pay for the badge uh <laughs> see um irrational at a minimum they would they didn't they never sent me but they never made me use my pto if i went well that's nice yeah so and i'd get a so i had to pay for i would crash at somebody else's hotel with like a friend would crash in like the orange hostel or something and down, yeah i think i did that too yeah uh, and then it's just the flights, which is not super bad from Boston. Yeah. Because they have a direct to SFO. Um, I, I, GDC is, it, it is such a fun, like there's a, there's a culture around it that's like really interesting. And I, I've always enjoyed going and just, you meet people that you haven't seen, you know, you've known them for years. Yeah. Um, for you get to learn so many new things. Like I remember like way back in the day, I remember seeing Jonathan Blow do a talk about like character readability or something like it was it was a deep talk that like I totally didn't understand. It wasn't about character readability. It was about something else. I have to look it up. I don't think I've seen that one. Yeah. But like afterwards, I was like talking to um, we were talking to uh, one of my coworkers, Mandra at the time. And I was just like, did you understand what he was saying? He was like, yeah, man, this guy's like next level. And I was like, man, that's probably why I didn't understand it. Because <laughs> I was just like, I was like, wow, okay. I, I sort of get what he's saying about certain things, but then other things I was kind of like. What? You know, I don't ever listen to design talks for the most part. Like I never, uh, these days when I go to GDC, I straight up don't go to the talks at all. I haven't for years now because you get like, a lot of them become the kind of the same talks after a while. Mm -hmm. Especially in art. I've never gone to the design talks though because I wasn't a designer. So I'm curious. I, to me, I feel like it's a lot like this really good talks about art direction, but art is so subjective. And one of the fun things about GDC is not these talks that are for a lot of people. The best part about GDC is, especially if you're a specialist, like I've always been a specialist in some way, meeting yeah. somebody else that does your exact job at the other studio. So like my job was making animation behavior systems in Morphine. And there are two other people in the world that do that. And they are both at GDC. And one of them is on like some other massive AAA project and the other one's on some other massive AAA project. And the three of us are gonna get together and just bitch about natural motion for like, <laughs> out, like, cause I will find those people. Like, and for me, that was what GDC was about. It was about connecting with like your doppelganger at another place. Like I always really enjoyed that. That's super funny. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, for, for a lot of that too, is just for me as a designer, when I would go, I would love, I loved picking other level designers brains about how they tackled certain problems in their games like i remember when dead space 2 had come out and then i went to a gdc and uh, my buddy ty introduced me to his level design buddy who did like worked on it yeah and we just chatted for like like an hour about the different systems and like the things that they had to deal with and then like you know philosophies behind the ai placements and stuff and and I just always loved doing that. Just being able to talk design with somebody else was was a fun thing to do. Um, not so much just like the technical limitations, because that stuff is just, you know, everybody's got different technical limitations on their editors. But just I loved just picking people's brains and just having discussions with them. Um, but yeah, you know, I've never been to a GDC where I didn't go to talks. Every GDC, of, well, I mean, that that changed a lot over the years, right? Like every GDC I've gone is different because my role in in the field has changed. Mm -hmm. And like the last couple I haven't gone to talks because like, so one, what was this last one? Okay, so the last one is unique. The one before that I was pitching the entire time mm -hmm. for the most part. I was- Oh, you mean like to, to publishers and yeah, stuff? Yeah, like we were pitching our next game at the Molasses Flood. I mean, GDC has a, a huge business component to it if right. you're on that side so as soon as i went indie a lot of it was pitching publishers setting up meetings with um people like super rare um who will take your game and put it on um physical releases like a lot of business mm -hmm. stuff over the last couple of years last year was interesting because it was a big split uh I'm trying to think actually i guess maybe it's been the last who no. was setting all those things up for you guys at the molasses when you were working at the molasses was it was it like microsoft at the time because the it at xbox stuff or was that just before 
the it at Xbox. You do it stuff. yourself, man. Like Forrest and I reach out to people. Oh wow! Well, so like you guys I, are I mean, pros. I, like I, I'm like, hey, Epic, you have a store. Like I'm like, mm-hmm. hey, Super Rare, how do I do this? Like you reach out to them, right, um, in different ways. Sometimes right, right. I do a surprising amount of business through Twitter DMs. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would work. Um, like I haven't. Uh, I shouldn't say anything. I'm already reaching out to some people about physical release stuff, just because I think it's cool. But we'll see. Uh, it's too. Early I hope now. you do. I'd like a little physical release of kind. I've got, yeah. I've got my uh, hat and time like Nintendo 64 box like over yeah. here. <laughs> now the Need last one was that. fun because the before I was never a designer, right? Like the last one I got to meet like. So Alan Hazelden has a Discord with like a bunch of puzzle game designers. That was my first time meeting like people in that sphere. And they're mm-hmm. fun. Like, I like those people. So the last time was mostly just hanging out and meeting those people and talking about puzzle stuff, which is really That's good. That's awesome. Yeah. Was that like a fun... Did that jolt you? Did that like... Yeah, yeah. Give you like a big boost? It's always good. Like I've never had a bad... I had a couple bad GDCs, I guess. Yeah. Uh, mostly, uh, you got to be willing to go in and it's okay if things don't pan out. Like you, you'll pitch a game and it won't kick off or something i was uh, like i've been to so many gdc's at this point you have to keep in mind i used to live in san francisco so a right. part of this is i'm going home <laughs> like right so the worst thing that happens is like i don't have something to do at night and i ping a friend that i used to know or i go do i go to a place that brings back a great amount of nostalgia like mm. like shit goes down i have nothing to do a night at gdc so i'll go to the dna lounge and i'll just dance and it'll remind me of like my youth right so there's no bad GDC for me, it's basically impossible. Yeah. Uh, but like, I remember the yeah, go ahead. No, nah, I, I don't know where else I'm going with that. Every GDC has been different just because my rules changed. Like, uh, do you think it, are you gonna? So going back to this next one though. Yeah. How do you feel about like what do you think your your role going forward in this next GDC? Can we stop talking about the future, Mojica? I'm really concerned <laughs> <laughs> that you're not taking the hint that I'm really freaked out about the future, man. Like, I don't know. We'll figure it out. Like, I gotta get through November and then curl up in a ball and shiver for a while. And then once I'm done shivering like a frightened gerbil, we'll figure out what happens after that. Like, there's, I got money. I'll be okay. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'll be promoting kind. Ki- Maybe kinds of fucking flop. And I'm looking for a job. Like, I don't know. We'll figure it out. <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. I have no idea. I should. I want to submit a talk to GDC, but they need to like have a rough outline before they accept it. So, and if it, so, I think I'm going to submit a talk, and it's just going to be like the best case scenario talk. Like, here's you how you sell two, two billion units. One is the uh, one is how kind flopped and how I'm bouncing back, and the other one is how kind succeeded and how I'm rolling what on if forward. Both get accepted. <laughs> what if I just what if I what if I give both? What if there's two then 15 minutes? You have, to, you have talks? to do one on both, and then you just like flip the script. <laughs> Yeah, like one talk is why this game was a success. Neither one's why it's a failure, and I just change the content depending on I don't yeah. know. What I think happens. that'd be great. You're like, this is why I think it was a, a failure, even though it's like <laughs> it's like doing so well. You're like, this was a personal failure for these reasons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that'd be a lot of fun. Somebody saying we yeah, have I did, I did write back to that one panel, and I'm just like, I'm afraid I can't give a talk on why how to run a studio that only release without having a hit game because I'm concerned that kind makes several billion copies. And <laughs> <laughs> as I wrote it, I was laughing, but then I was like, maybe it will. We don't know. We don't know. Stay positive. Fix your fucking key bindings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. That would be, uh, no, it won't. Be it won't. You're like, it won't. I was coming up here to talk about how it wasn't a success, but then, you know, it how do she would be- that be too? Like, what if, like, I don't know. There's no, it's I don't know. I don't know the future, man. We'll find out. Most likely, most likely, kind is about okay. Like <laughs> most games do, okay. Like I mean, we were talking about like the you know what is somebody asked last time what success means to like you know you and it, generally speaking, most indies think success is I can keep working on my next game. You know, I can keep doing the next oh, that's thing. Minimum minimum viable success, which yeah. I've cleared because. I do think it's the Gwen way, which is mostly selling out to whoever will give me money ahead of time. <laughs> you know what? I've like at this point, 
I literally gave a talk at console about like, you know how I succeed? It's by selling out real hard. I love like, it. Is that what then, you did? Is that, was, that, was that the talk? Yeah, I, the opening of that was like, here's how you succeed as an indie studio. But the you thing sell is, the fuck out? <laughs> well, no, I think that one was a fake out where I was like, get laid off. <laughs> like, mm. Yeah. No. I think I watched that one actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, you got to get laid off. <laughs> That's how you start a studio, get laid off. Look at all these other studios. People... Studios close, everyone gets laid off, and then amazing indie studios crop up. That's how it's done. Get your <laughs> go Get work your at a AAA together, company. Big studios that need to start layoffs. We need more massive studio closures. It's the best oh thing for the gosh. indie space. Shh, 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 shh. Yeah, no. You're but... gonna start freaking people out. <laughs> I think. Um, I think afterwards, like you know, like so, it would be valuable to have a panel of indies, like for example. Like you, me, and quite a few other people where we just talk about going from AAA to indie and what that was like for us. And because everybody has a different story. You have a different story. Mm -hmm. I have a different story. Um, but like the more of that that kind of gets out there, I feel like more people will be able to identify to one of those things. It's sort of like launching your game. There's a billion ways to do it. Mm -hmm. But like here's the here's the way that, you know, the, this group of people were able to transition from that AAA because I think a lot of people that are in AAA right now that would love to just throw up a, a middle finger them. to their boss and walk there's out. Enough, there's enough indies. Let's stop encouraging the AAA people to leave their good jobs, okay? <laughs> <laughs> we don't need. I more, don't know. We don't need more there's, competition, Mahika. Stop it. <laughs> there's definitely like I don't know. Every once in a while. Yeah, we don't need any more company. Yeah, no, you guys are. That, that's actually that's actually the opposite talk. Is how to go from indie to AAA would be like the joke. You know, most people. <laughs> no, that's what most. Well, the thing is, everybody. The grass is always greener, right? Like a lot of kids graduate from college, and then they they do. So it's different when you think indie. You and I think the same thing when we think of going AAA to indie. We think about like inside and like what most people call triple I. But the reality is the vast majority of people who are indie are making much smaller games, largely living hand to mouth, probably not making a profit, doing this as a hobby. And a lot of those people yeah. are looking to go into AAA, right? So and yeah, so part of like this a... is you have to define what is indie, right? Because technically neither one of us went indie. Like I went, I founded an indie studio with Forrest and five other so I got together with five other ex AAA people, founded a studio, kickstarted it within a year, uh, got funded to the tune of a couple hundred thousand dollars, and then went to Microsoft to fund the rest of it through an exclusivity deal on the Xbox. Like that's not most people's indie. Most people's indie is like I graduated college, I really, really want a job in games, and I'm making it work by making things on itch, right? And so sure. you have to. Ex that's a different market. That's a totally different. Yeah, you know. but I mean. The triple I industry is an interesting space. Um, I don't actually think that I qualify yet to be in that space. And I don't know what it actually takes to qualify to be in that space. I don't know. Do I think, think that's just like a, there's a fuzzy logic there where it's like, okay. You're trying to put it into buckets. The problem is trying to put it into buckets at all. We're all small business owners making games. And some people are, I think there's a bucket that's hobbyists, which is this is not your livelihood. As soon as it's your livelihood and you're paying yourself a paycheck off of it, I think that puts you, you're, you're, you I think a different that bucket. is the only line. And even then there's a lot of difference there, right? Like Double Fine was indie. We talked about Jonathan Blow earlier. The Witness is an indie game. That's a $40 indie game from like a developer that's spending a couple million dollars. It's very different from an indie game that's on itch, right? Like how do you yeah. put all of these people in the same bucket? You really can't. And the difference... Like I mean, the kinds no reason of to problems this. you have when you're in these anywhere on the spectrum and the spectrum isn't like a 2D, a 1D or 2D thing. There's like, what is the size of the game you're making? What is the, uh, the different genres of very different problems? We have more in line. Like, I think you and I have more in common with the average AAA developer than we do with the average uh, hobbyist developer. Yeah. So what, what you're saying is we're closer to the T-Rex than the T-Rex is to the first dinosaur? <laughs> what was the, <laughs> the fossil argument? Sorry, never mind. <laughs> yeah, I, I get it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's it, it, it's different for a lot of people. And I think I do think that it's interesting to talk about, though. And you do need to have like a breadth of 
of discussion around some of that to some degree. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people that would love to switch up what they're doing to get to like a different what were you calling it a bucket the grass so. is always greener it's fun to try different things it's fun to do different things but to me the fun thing about being indie is finding the people who are kind of in a very similar sphere like i have alan hazelden he's been on the podcast before like he's yeah. i love like alan hazelden he's we're very we're making similar scoped games we're both making puzzle games we're both making games about the same in the same budget range we're both indie but his path there was from uh the itch starting out like i started in triple a and went, oh, to, really? went to here and he started out in a different place so it's really fun talking to him also, that's interesting he so he came from making stuff on itch uh technically no he he started out i mean i imagine he's put quite a few things on itch i don't know if that's exactly where he started but he mm. made puzzle games uh he's big on mobile he's confused that i'm not putting kind on a phone <laughs> uh he, I'm a little confused too, to be honest with you. Uh, that would that seems like a great market to port to after yeah. it's released. I mean, I got a couple of cards. I've a couple of people I'm talking to. I think there's one company specifically in China called fucking Tap Tap. I'd have to find it. Um, I was oh, I see. Speaking with them, I think it'd be useful to get just knock out two birds with one stone. Get somebody that can do the port to mobile, plus also look over the Chinese translations and launch it because mobile is so much bigger in China. But on the other hand, like, I'm going to give it a, I'll figure that I got enough going on. That might be what I'm doing at GDC next year. Hunting down more people like that and talking to them. Who is it? Tap Tap? I I don't know. Look, they sponsored the Indie Mega Booth. Oh, they did? Uh, okay. Tap Joy, Tap Tap, one of the taps. Tapping. Yeah, we had, we had some, um some like panda people swinging by and they were like they were like yeah we'd love to put proteus on the phone in china i was like cool <laughs> yeah. well the mobile market's very different in china like uh i think part of the reason why there's a lot of overlap between companies that do mobile ports and chinese companies is because um in america when we think of mobile games we think of like idle games whereas in china they have games like fortnite on mobile markets on the mobile yeah that's the, like their whole yeah, like yeah. The f- it's like a different culture for them, for sure. Yeah, just the gaming gaming is different there. I was been interested. I want to check it. I'd love to go to. I've never been to Asia, really. I'm trying to think. I've never really been outside America that much. I'd like to travel. Yeah, more. I mean, going going being in Sweden for like a little bit, like a few years, and just traveling around there made me really. I've I've missed that geography, and. Coming like Memphis is pretty flat. When Seth came by the other day, you know Seth Rosen, yeah. he was swinging by my hometown on his way to New York or whatever, and uh, we we went up to this um, we went up to like one of the tallest places and like was on this like balcony looking over Memphis, and I realized how flat everything is because you could literally see for miles and miles and miles, and I was like, oh yeah, that's over there by my house. Like you could see this this one thing sticking out. And it's like, oh yeah, I could literally point at all of the different things, and uh, and I just realized how much I missed um, Europe and and its rockiness, and, and it was great to be in Seattle for that like one oh, particular thing. Yeah, I love mountains. But There's... I could imagine going to like China or being in Hong Kong and uh, South Korea, for example. Like Japan would be kind of fun. Uh, I think Japan would be a lot of fun to go around and just walk. I the streets like, see the thing is i need like a business reason mostly like so i got to travel around norway because i got console flew me out there and ever since then i've been like i've been busy but i want to find speaking opportunities where they'll pay for your flights yeah, that's a good point that's what i want like that's or, such an indie thing to say I, it's so <laughs> true well it's like I'm gonna. I people like my talks, so why not? Like, and I don't have you know like money or reasons. But I, I think my big ones on my list is I really want to, um, because Alan and everybody talks about Melbourne Game Week. I really want to try Australia, mm. and it's literally the other side of the world. So like, spend a week, check out Australia. That'd be fun. That actually sounds like a good time. I wouldn't mind doing that because. You know, when you go to like a different place and like the culture is just so different and like everybody talks different, that would be. It's not that bad. No, no, no. I mean, the, the way that they talk is just just different, and I and I enjoy that, and I and I appreciate that. It's, it's very similar when you know when you're in Sweden. Yeah, 
anything like that. But I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, I like I, for that. I want to like. I think Japan would be cool. I'd like to go to a Tokyo Game Show someday. That'd be fun. We have a friend uh, in Memphis that went to Japan and went, wants to like basically be our tour guide. And I think you kind of need. For me, it's like you really want to go with somebody who kind of knows their way around a little bit or has like a plan. So that way you're just kind of bouncing between things would be a lot of fun. But also say, like, so this is a, if you ever get a chance to talk at console, do it because it's the wrong time of year to visit Norway. Um, but they are, a, and it's a very expensive country, but they, yeah. they put, how do I put it? They invite only a handful of speakers. So we're talking like 20 speakers. They're mm-hmm. all really interesting. They're all the best in their field, and they all they take us all out to dinner and to lo- like have local a local guide show you around for the two days of console. Mm-hmm. So it's just, and they'll fly you out there and they'll fly you home, but you doesn't have to be from there. So like one thing a lot of people did was they flew out there, they spent a cup, they spoke, they hung out with these speakers. I got to meet Oscar who made um uh, fucking he was one of two people that made a game called Bad North. He's like mm, yeah. a tech artist Unity shader guy. Does a lot of Unity tutorials. Is Unity version of Gwen. Uh, So, like, I get to hang out. Everyone's just my doppelganger in some way or other. But, like, we're all shades of... We're all some percentage towards being as cool as Gwen, but not quite. Fifty shades of Gwen? Yeah. He's like me, but Unity. Uh, So, I could have been there if it wasn't. He was Unity. So, they took you around the city. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, you get to hang out with other developers that are, you know doing cool shit and checking out this foreign city and then afterwards you can fly to like Paris and all you have to pay for is your flight from Paris and they'll pay for your flight from Paris back to your home so that's, that's pretty really sweet. cool yeah that's why if you ever get a chance to speak console do it I remember um anybody in Sweden was like yeah Norway's just the better Sweden <laughs> like like everybody everybody they just like they were like yeah n- yeah Norway's just oh, the more yeah, expensive they told me, like what is it Swedish people are super uptight is that the thing I don't know. They might Swedish, be considered that. I, I mean, yeah, I honestly, though, it's such a different culture than the U.S. It's just it's a it's a bit of a shock, but it's also like a good thing. And it's a weird thing. You know, there's like one beer I like and it's called. Well, there's some beers I like. But there's one I actually really like. It's called Duvel. And I went to Stockholm after Norway because mm-hmm. uh, they, they flew me from Stockholm back to Boston. And gotcha. There's actually like. This is where they make it. And I got to go to a bar that was like the Duvel bar and have like, for, I, I'm just, I don't know what I'm talking about. Was that, was that like in the uh, central the, Stockholm we've area? We've reached the point where we've stopped talking about game stuff and we should probably wrap this up soon. <laughs> Actually, what time? We've is jumped it? the shark with this. But yeah, it was like downtown in Stockholm. And I was like, oh my God, there's a place where you can get this fresh. This is amazing. What magical place. But yeah, everyone in Norway, I think said that everybody from Sweden was super uptight. Yeah, there's there's a lot of like interesting things that uh, that people would just be jumping back and forth. They say like you know if you if you work in Norway, you get paid a lot of money because it's so expensive to live there. So a lot of people just live in Sweden over the border just by a little bit because it's way cheaper. So they'll live in Sweden and then go across the border each day to work Norway's and get paid expensive. like double, uh, which is pretty interesting. Um, Norway's expensive. I was told Swedes are uptight. I don't actually know if that's true. Uh, could be a little true. <laughs> I had my my buddy Thomas, who who lives in Sweden, join the join my stream the other day, and we're always talking about stuff like that, and uh, it's just a lot of fun. I mean, I think what would be interesting is, uh, you know what? Okay, so back to sort of like, and then we can go because uh, I kind of need to get going. But um, the the discussion of you know, when you're indie, you know, and if you don't have too many ties to like the city you live in, you could literally go anywhere, you know? Yeah. Like I was talking to Seth about this and, he, you know, he was living in, uh, was it San Francisco or? Uh, yeah, New York for a while. He was in San Francisco. He was hanging out in Boston for a while. He was developing all over. I mean, like Alan Hazelden is super cool for that. He travels the world. He has no permanent residence. He makes games from wherever. Uh, what games did he make? He um was Cosi- he the, Cosmic he... Express, A Good Snowman is Hard to Build. Uh, did you do one about like uh like green creatures that like you drag their limbs and stuff? Was that was that him? Maybe not. No, but like I think there's there's definitely like a, a like a portion of the indie sphere where you're like, oh cool, they just like went to live in Tokyo for like two weeks and just 
chilled in like the middle of Tokyo and like at a cafe and worked on their game. And then, you know, that just seems super appealing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'll admit I would, I'm excited. I think that's cool too. Uh, to me, yeah. it seems really expensive, but then I live in Boston. So what could be more expensive? And it, Alan Hayes. Did you always live in Boston? You didn't always no, live I in Boston. I lived in San Francisco before that. Yeah. Well, I mean, would you ever consider leaving Boston or? Yes. In a heartbeat. I fucking hate this place. <laughs> You're not still in Quincy, are you? No, I'm in I'm in Cambridge now. I'm over uh, like on the Cambridge Somerville border. Gotcha. I lived in Quincy the entire time I was there, yeah, but I, I was too. like up the hill. I was at the top of the hill, so you know if like well, if happiness, a storm hit. <laughs> happiness in life is proportional to uh, how short your commute is, right? Like yeah. if you have My to, commute was hella short. Exactly. Like if you have like a short walking commute, you will be happier than if you have like an hour long drive commute, right? I, I never there's some I mean it depends because like, like when I said like when I was in Stockholm like having a 40 minute like moment to like reflect on personal thoughts and stuff like that was actually pretty good and I miss that now so now I'm trying to like force myself to go on my balcony every day and just sit and think or like write notes or whatever schedule that shit I mean there is something to um, I do like a reason to something I don't have now that I work like my bed is there and I work here uh, something I don't have is a reason to put on pants and go for a walk. Like I have to decide to walk at all. Yeah. Uh, I have to make the conscious decision every day that I should probably go outside and walk a bit, uh, <laughs> which you should do. Um, That's why I love my dog because she's my she's yeah. my walk buddy and she enjoys walks a lot. So <laughs> I just like and responsibility would be the thing that I don't like at all. <laughs> it's the only reason I, don't, I love dogs. I love dogs. Don't like responsibility in any way. No. I mean, I did like a deep, like, according to everybody that I talked to, they were like, oh, have you ever owned a dog before? And I was like, well, you know, when I was little, but now I'm on my own. And they're like, oh, but you're getting a husky first? And I was like, yeah, is there a big deal? They're like, that's a deep dive. Like, you're literally going in the deep end with a husky first. And I was mm -hmm. like, didn't seem like that big of a deal. But yeah, huskies are pretty... <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, look you know, pick up their poop. They got big poop. No, they don't. Compared to like a small dog, like I'd rather get a terrier. I'm not. I mean, the cleaning up poop, you're gonna have to do it no matter what. <sighs> but I think it's. I think what's great is that they're super. They're super their own person. Like my dog, just she'll decide when she wants to listen and when she doesn't. She's not like a golden retriever who will just do everything you ask her to do. You're, I was just like Chloe, don't eat that, and she'll look at me. And then she'll slowly numb on the thing that I'm telling her not to. And then, uh, then, uh, like, then she'll drop it. She'll run under the bed and do her little thing. Anyways, oh, right. I got to go take that. her out now. So we should probably wrap this okay, up. Okay, that seems fair. That's a good spot. All right. Thanks for chatting with me, man. This is fun. And thanks for hanging out, everybody. I'm sorry we didn't talk to you guys directly as much. Uh, it's, it's funny how like, you, you had yeah. this list of things that we were going to talk about. I think we covered some of them. Did we? I mean, it wasn't a list. It was like, here's topics we could cover. Okay. Did you write them down? I forgot. No, I, I think next time, because you actually did give me like a day or two heads up. Next time I'm going to write down as many notes as I possibly can. You want to sound intelligent? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, <laughs> yeah, because you know, I always sound intelligent when I God. talk out loud. <laughs> oh, God. All right. It was fun. Thanks to everybody for hanging out and special thanks to um was it Jessica? Jessica Mac. Yeah, for um for raiding. That was super cool. Yeah, who do you guys want to hang out with next? I'll raid whoever you say. Just type somebody in. We'll raid them. Let me see who's going right now. I've got nobody online right now, unfortunately. I wish there were more indies that would do talks like this. They probably are. I just don't know about them. Yeah, I stopped streaming as much and also stopped watching streams since the summer. Like, I don't think I've seen a streamer since the summer. Oh, man. Um, oh, Lana Lux. I've heard of Lana. Lana? I don't know. She's been on my recommended people. All right, we will, we will raid Lana Lux. So say goodbye, and then I will type this in. Sure. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Oh, it's going to be like eight seconds. This is awkward. Yeah, it's got to load, and then you got to like click the go button. How many raiders do we have? 35, 37. 
Oh, oh can cool. You, can you see it? Yeah. It says it on the chat top right. Oh, word. Okay. For me. That's pretty Sweet. cool. Later, guys. All right. Bye, everybody. Oh, she's modeling something. Cool.